Okay, here we go. Clap one. On three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm beat. <laughs> beat? <laughs> I, I'm beat. Today's, it's it's been a day. It's been a week. It's been a month. Um, it's been a year. It's, well, <laughs> the year, the year has been a lot. The year has been a lot. Uh summer vacation is great yeah lovely sure. love it um i i i have not been used to my children being home all the time while i'm working right um i was used to it when i was home before when i was you know uh working from home anyway but doing this yeah and stopping my like i want to like they go out the door at quarter after eight. They walk in the door just after four. Right. That, and then I put my head down. I work. And magically, they're just suddenly here. But now, they're just always here. Yeah. Great. Love them to pieces. But I'll like be like 10 minutes into something and I'll get like a, I need a drink. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Get the drink. Come back. 20 minutes later. Can I have a snack? It's like, I, I just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, and then I ever the try, my goal in life is to always make sure children are happy. Of course. I, I, I just want children to be happy. Um, so I will go above and beyond for any child. Cause it's, it's what I like to do. Um, <laughs> So at the beginning of summer, I was like, well, we're not taking any vacations. So maybe, like, let's just talk. What are some fun things we can do that are things you don't do during during the year that, you know, would make it seem like we're doing like fun activities. So we wrote down like a big list of activities. And I was like, great, we're going to do these off and on throughout the summer. Well, <laughs> summer's half over. And a chop, chop, Christy, get on that list. Uh, we've done one of the things, uh, which was take them to a movie, which we did not really want to see, uh, but it was the kids wanted to see it. So we're like, great. You sure you don't want to go see Thor? No. Okay. My old, my middle one wanted to go see Thor. Uh, but my youngest one was like, nah, he would rather watch those little yellow things yelling about bananas. Of course. Which again, I had no problem with the movie. It's just, I'll see it. But I, I I don't really want to pay a hundred dollars to sit in a theater to see it. <laughs> yeah, I get you know that. what I mean. You know yeah. what I mean. But it was fine. It was fine, and it was just it's just there's so little time. So I'm like, oh, okay. Yesterday I knew we were recording today, so I'm like, I got to make sure my notes are done. But I also have so many errands to run tomorrow. Well, these solutions obvious. Uh, stay up till four in the morning to finish your notes, so that during the awake hours. You can run the errands when the stores are open. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then get the kids to swimming lessons, which has been a real, a real thorn in my paw, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. I normally hear thorn in my side. I like that you've gone <laughs> as though you're a Lion King. That you've. This is the, the circle of life. This um, is my first uh, bag of worms since bag of worms. It might be. And that's nice. <laughs> it's nice to know season four, but you more, can't. More, you, more, more. You, you can take the girl out of season one, but you can't take the season one out of the girl. And that's you know? it. And that's it. You know, and speaking of that, um, yeah. this isn't even speaking of that really, no. but you know, no, this is see, from season one. We've talked about, you know, there's been so many things that have come up on this show where we've talked about like, oh, we should do a science podcast. Oh, we should do another whatever podcast. But yeah. recently we yeah. made some commercials featuring some characters we created uh, called Larry and Bert Bird, the Bird Brothers. If you haven't, go to our socials, go to Instagram at True Crime and Cocktails. If you scroll back, you're going to find uh, some icons where we're, uh, we're, we're, we're dressed up. 
we're yeah. dressed up. We got some mustaches on. Uh, you're going to notice right away. Oh, that's uh, that's not that's not the gals we know. They're they're they've got mustaches on. Any hoodle. Um, we had so much fun doing these characters. Uh, July twelfth. Yeah. I just looked. July twelfth on our Instagram. You can just see one of the commercials there. Um, that uh, we we knew that we might get some uh, love for these characters that we had created. And boy, oh boy, oh, did we. Uh, so <laughs> many of you, dear listeners, reached out saying, we want a full Burton and Larry podcast. <laughs> and so we were like, can we, what can we do? Long story short, too late. Over on Patreon, patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. We offer bonus episodes. And this month we decided for, for our top tier of subscribers, we would put out an episode of uh, Burton and Larry yeah. having their own podcast. And it was... <laughs> just a hoot and a half it was so funny and so fun we improvised the whole thing um had a couple things we had both come up with a couple very small things i wrote read a list and christy planned a game but we had nothing planned in terms of uh you know where we were talking about them and it was just god did we laugh yeah and right now this desk is covered in hairs like well Bert, bert's a shedder <laughs> let's tell you that it should also be yeah. noted that we decided it would be funny if we made our backgrounds what Bert and Larry's houses would look like. And so mm -hmm. Christy's mm -hmm. got one that looks like, you know, a bachelor pad basement. There's a yeah. poster of Dolly Parton on the wall. Yeah. Bert's biggest crush, we've learned. Of course. Um, and then mine was more of like a living room setting. But on the back wall, of course, is a is a giant, giant picture of him and his ex-wife, Donna, on their <laughs> wedding day, because uh, he is obviously not over Donna yet. Um, anyway, in the photo I photoshopped was me as Bert, sorry, as Larry, me as Larry, but then Donna is also played by me, <laughs> which is Christy's <laughs> idea. And I thought it was so funny. Anyway, long story short, we recorded this last night and we put it out today. That's how up to the minute that, that episode was. Yeah. But I had a very serious business meeting, business zoom this morning and I logged on and totally forgot. And sure enough, what was my background? But it was Larry's Larry's living room, <laughs> including a photo of me and me as Larry holding each other. And I was like, oh, boy, got to just get rid of that then, don't I? Oh, shoot. Now, it was fine. It got a laugh. It was a good story. But it was just one of those funny moments where I was like, well, that broke the ice in this very serious business meeting, uh, which is always great. Always great. Yeah. Um. So anyway, check that out. Larry and Bert Bird, the Bird Brothers, um, their uh, their podcast, of course, is going to be called uh, True Crime and Cocktails too, because they may be trying to ride on the clout of an already existing uh, podcast. But I've I've already given away too much. Uh, Patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails to learn more. Now, we are recording this, and today tonight is the yeah. new moon, the new moon in yeah. Leo. So for people who've maybe been following along with us from the beginning, I've gotten over the course of. Uh, of us doing this show, I've gotten more and more into my crystals, my moons, my my uh, witchiness, for lack of a better term. And so I thought it might be nice because it's a new moon. And I don't think that I have pulled any tarot cards on this show to just do a quick pull. Just one card each hey. from this deck that I've got. Yeah. Uh, this is an oracle deck <laughs> called Vessel. And uh, I was really excited about this. We might do a pull from one other one, too. It doesn't. We're just going to see. Um, but anyway. If you don't like tarot, you don't like what this is all about, don't worry. This doesn't have to be for you. You can just skip ahead like 10 minutes right now and uh, we'll get into the case. But yeah. uh, or cases in terms of this episode. But this yeah. is this is harmless. This is uh, no harm, no foul. I just thought since it's the new moon, uh, which, you know, is a good time to set intentions, all of the above. I'd just like to know what uh, what's going to be be bringing to be brought to us in this next moon cycle. So we're going to hey. start with uh, with young Christy over there. And I'm just going to start by saying, you know, um, this is only, I'm only calling upon those with good intentions for us to answer through these cards. And I, my question for the cards is, uh, you know, when it comes to young Christy, uh, Lynn Oxborough over there, uh, what should she expect during this next moon cycle? So let's see, let's see what the Oracle card. Oh, pop right out at me. Here we go. What's the card hey. we've got? Structure. Okay. Structure. Let's see what the book says about structure, although it feels a little literal to me. <laughs> this is amazing. This is all it offers. This is all it offers. Yeah. What does structure mean to you? Do we need to fly free or get grounded? 
Interesting. All right. We're going to pull from the second deck too, because I feel like we need a little bit of extra, just extra clarity, just to maybe something with a little bit more to, a little bit more meat. We're just going to pull one sure. more card for you. Sure. So this is by the same, the same person. This is an Iris deck and these decks. Are oh, that's so nice. And you're, you know, I, I learned you're supposed to technically uh, never buy yourself a tarot deck. They're supposed to always be gifts. Sure. I saw these as gifts for myself, so I think it counted. All right, cards. Let's uh, let's get a little more clarity. We're seeing, okay, Christy, that what's happening in this next moon cycle is structure. Do we have anything further uh, to offer to that? Oh, a card flipped. Here we go. Wow. All right, two flipped. So we'll read these both. <laughs> I love this for you. The first one, noble. <laughs> noble. Yeah. And the second one? I like that. Can't be caught. Oh. Can't be caught. So let's just read these real quick. No bull. Let's see what this says for you. This card wants to confront you with those little white lies you might feed yourself or accept from other people. It's time to get rid of all that bull. This card is as stubborn as it gets, and if you don't look at these little falsehoods right now and try to move around this card, uh, it's not moving. Okay. Wow, aggressive. A little bit of sass from the Iris deck. <laughs> you know how I feel about sass? Oh, I'm for yeah, this it. card. I like this one. And I think that this is what I like for you mostly here. This is the can't be caught card. You are movement. Hey. And your movement allows you to better explore how you fit into this world. Dance on, little darling. You are completely free in this moment, in this time, and you are shining your lovely grace on everything you touch. We see hands from all around trying to grasp you as you dance out into the sky. Hands that want to take part in your magic. Hands that want to slow you down. Hands that want to bring you down to earth. You are too fast. No one can catch you and no one can tame you or slow you down. So it's time for a solo journey. Put on your dancing shoes and wiggle your way out into your own personal cosmos. Enjoy the nectar of freedom and discovery. You know what I'm hearing hey, from now. all of this? Yeah. These three cards together, what I'm hearing is, you know, structure. It asks, what does structure mean to you? And is this a time for structure or is this a time for not? And what I'm hearing is it's not. What I'm hearing is be free. Be free. We've only got so much of summer left. You just alluded to this at the beginning of what we were talking I did. about. And this is I saying did. here, you know what? Stop lying to yourself. No <laughs> more bull. You want to do something for you. You want to yeah. feel footlight and fancy free. So yeah. get dancing, little darling. Well, you'll love this. While you were uh, reading um, the uh, can't be caught. Yeah. Instantly in my head, I was like, huh, I just got a tattoo idea. <laughs> Does that mean I'm going to, I already have an idea that I have not uh, spoken to anyone about. And by anyone, I mean a tattoo artist. Um, <laughs> so does that mean I'm going to get two? I just have to think of where it's going to go. Well. If I'm I might be anything losing from that card, I don't the know. answer is yes. Yeah. Well, this is me in the wind. It's just you in the wind, baby. I like that. that well, goes. listen, they say, you know, whatever whatever resonates with you. I mean, listen to your intuition. It's all about what we uh, take in the moment. Yeah. All right. Do a quick pull for me, and then we're going to get into it. Here we go. We're going back to the vessel deck. We're calling on spirit guides, only those with our highest intentions. What does what this next moon cycle have in store for me? Lauren Elizabeth Ash. Show me what you got, vessel. Ooh, nothing coming out. Wow, does this mean my my fate is not yet sealed? Maybe I have to draw a card. Usually they just start coming flying out. I, oh, 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 I said that in literally like 85 of them. I'm just going to take this top one, the top card to fly out here. And I love this. Spirit. Hey, now. Spirit. And it's a finger pointing to a star. Look at that. Hey. Well, let's see what this says. Spirit, which I want you to know. Spirit is right next to structure. Those are two side-by-side -side of cards. Of course it is. Connect with your spirit. Let it guide you. Listen to your truest desires. And if ever it feels like there was a better way to describe the two of us, it is spirit, spirit and structure, doesn't it? it feels <laughs> <laughs> that is the odd couple, spirit does, and structure. Oh, it God, does feel right. like those would be our... Those would be our two. I'm loving this. Okay. Well, look, I'm going to go right to the Iris deck here. Any further, anything further for me to, to glean? Any any further messages about this next moon cycle for old Ash? Let's see. Oh, wow. Okay. There we go. First card that flipped. First card that flipped. 
So we're going to go with, oh, you know what? Well, I, there was two, there was two stuck back to back. That's what we're going to go with. Okay. Wow. The first card. Yeah. The one who needs to control. Interesting. And the second. Yeah. Everything will be okay. I love that for me. Hey. Well, let's give this a quick read. The one who needs to control. Whoa. That's literally what it says. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was something really impressive. I know. It's literally. That was a reaction. Whoa. Where to begin? This way of being isn't helping anyone. Fear can cause us to try to control ourselves, others, our path. What this obsessive energy does is make us more stuck than we were before and even more afraid. Take a deep breath. You're going to be okay. Isn't that wild that the other card was everything is going to be okay? Holy shit. I know it's hard. When we release our fist, when we give way to letting life watch over us, we can be free. The need to control is so closely followed by disappointment when things don't go our way. What does that mean? What is your way? And how has it changed from 10 years ago? This is a wild card right now. <laughs> <laughs> what were your goals and desires then? Things change so much, we can't predict what will make us truly happy until we try new things, and sometimes the best of those new experiences are happy accidents. Palms up, hands open, receive all the wonders waiting for you. Hey! I feel like this is so relevant to me right now. Uh, and let's just give this next one a real quick, everything will be okay, which again, I love that that was listed in this card. And this is a very short intro. It just says, honey, honey, do not fret too much. Every little thing is going to be okay. Hey. That makes me want to cry. <laughs> so beautiful. I, I mean, uh, look, I'm on board. Listen, I think I was, I actually just did an interview uh, the other day for Hello Canada magazine. That's going to be coming hey. out soon. And I was talking a lot about some of the, the themes that I've talked about in my Instagram posts over the last little while. And, you know, a lot of the conversation and listen, I haven't read the article yet, so I don't know how much of it they have used or not used. But a lot of it was about like really questioning what those those beliefs that we had 10 years ago, 20 years ago as children, sure. the things that were kind of programmed into believing um, life is all about was really it was really kind of getting into that. So so those cards feel like very relevant to me right now. This makes me very yeah. excited for this next moon cycle. Words that I never thought I would say six months ago to a year ago. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, it, it's just wild. I never, I never in our, in our days thought that I would hear you talk about the moon cycle in earnest, but I, yeah. I'm living for it. I like this season for growth, growth. Yeah. Growth. And hey, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to open them. I'm currently because I, oh, I can't even begin to think about it yet. But what's been sitting on uh side of my desk here for a while? I know you're not. I'm going to use your thing and say that I got it as a gift for myself. Yeah. I uh, the uh, labyrinth tarot oh, deck. Yeah. Because I know I haven't opened it yet, but like those cards, like the art is so beautiful that I was like, I'm going to need to look at that. And uh, dear, dear listener, Lauren. Wow. Sent supernatural tarot. That's, a, that's I nice. I mean, again, speaking of beautiful. Good God. I love that. Uh, but yes, they've been sitting on my desk awaiting my. Uh, my attention. And you know uh, what? I think we need to have, have like a Zoom, a Zoom sleepover sometime soon. Yeah. And just get into all of them. Light a bunch of candles. You know what I mean? See what yeah. kind of shenanigans we can get into in the spirit realm and we cut the bull yeah you know spirit and structure spirit and structure i couldn't be happier because you're right spirit and structure like that's if if we were a cartoon mm -hmm. it would be spirit and structure yep. and it would be spirit who's like joy from inside out and it would be structure who's just kind of like the old man from up, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just like a little, like likes things just so, I mean, you wouldn't know that uh, based on my house, but you know, it is what it is. And I get that. But I think that the real, best. the real metaphor to me is that in the deck, they're back to back. So they couldn't be closer, but they also yeah. couldn't be more unique. Yeah. And look at the beauty in that. 
That makes sense. I love that. Yeah. Uh, now, I just have to say along those lines very quickly, there's been a series of memes that have been going around on the internet where it's the, the, the little miss drawings and yes. then people have been adding their own. And I just have to say, for the record, that was a bit that Christy and I were doing in high school. Remember? Yeah. We got these little like beanbag toy things that were like made out of, it was oh like God. sand filled with a, a like a, like an old balloon filled with sand with like googly eyes and stuff. Yeah. And it looked like those Little Miss characters. Yeah. And Christy, she named hers Little Miss Disturbed. Didn't you? I think so. Yeah. And the other one was like Little Miss Punk Rock or something. And I think that was Yes. Nice. Um, so anyway, all of this to say is every time I see one of those, I was like, I feel like we've been ripped off, even though it was a bit that existed like <laughs> 30, 30 years ago. Um, and it absolutely can exist in both times and places and no one would of ever course. have known it. Uh, but I just had to give us credit because I because we were the OGs of that joke. I well, thank you for that callback because I had completely forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. You're and right. I thought oh about us of as teens. Very advanced what? jokes. Well, and also just so funny. My only disappointment is that I wish every trip that we had done, there was a video camera. I know. Because I know we, I think we only did it the once. Uh, but I wish we had done it more. I think I rented a video camera three times in my lifetime. And then we ended up buying one and then I never used it. <laughs> so it's like they rented it. It was like a rent it, give it to the kids for the weekend and go have fun. And then we filmed whatever, but I was too young to really be able to participate. It's fine. I'm not upset about it. The point is then you came to visit. So yeah. it was like, you know, it'll keep them busy for a couple of days. Rent them a camera. <laughs> and they, and they did. And what a time. What a time. And, you know, I love that when we were literal children, yeah, that was what it was. Like, give them a camera, let them make their videos for a weekend. And I want to also say that I spent the bulk of this past weekend as a full adult yeah, uh, doing that here with my friend, uh, with a friend of mine. So it was so listen, it feels full circle. And that yeah. feels like it connects to the reading I just had about, like, where were you 10 years ago? Well, where were you? <laughs> where were you 20, 20 years ago making these videos and here you are once again doing the same thing but you know what I like yeah. about that tapping into that childhood that childlike quality that I feel like we all should connect to more yes. of us oh yeah I mean I've been talking especially this past year about listen to that inner child and just give her what she wants give her what yeah. she's been begging for for years there's a reason that I have a pile of many brands <laughs> structure uh, in containers in their order the way they should be. <laughs> and I'm like, I got a couple sacks of them somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is and, again, spirit and structure. And mine are in a, in a home with children, but it's a look, but don't touch. Yes. <laughs> they, they get the extras. Well, yes. only one of them cares, uh, but he gets the extras. So it's fine. Um, but like the things that I've purchased in the last year, I never would have done it before because I was like, oh, that's not necessary. And now I'm just like, give her what she wants. Let her roam free. Let her dance free in the wind. See? You know what I mean? I love this. There's a reason I have the plush Buzz Lightyear. Yep. There's a reason that I... <laughs> I have planned out uh, how my Funko Pops are going to be arranged, but I've had to print the list out three times because I keep buying so many in between that it now won't make sense. One day, I just want to take a single day to do it yeah. and just organize them and, and have fun because is organizing what's fun for me? It is structure. And, you know, there is a reason why I had a party over the last weekend and I rented an ice cream truck to come hey. to the house for an hour and also a nice sculpture booze luge where you pour booze in the top and then you drank out of the butthole. Yeah. It's uh, again, spirit. It's if that's <laughs> not, if that's not the combination that so beautifully describes Lauren Ash as a person <laughs> where there's like <laughs> adult ice sculptures. Yes. Childlike wonder mm -hmm. together together 
And yeah. then me go, going down my my water slide. It was one of the greatest days of my life. I'm going to be honest with you. It was. Up I'm so glad the water slide got finished. Yeah, that was a journey, but we it got was. there. We got hey. it there. It's it's all it's all positivo. But yeah, you know, again, um, it, and it, it. I think the thing is 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 you know, in in looking back, and this isn't a flex. It's not a brag. It's more just about like how do you want to allot your funds, and that was how I wanted to allot my funds. <laughs> I want. Yeah. I wanted to give all of my friends who could make it in LA, yeah, uh, an adult ice sculpture, a lunch, and ice cream. <laughs> I think that's lovely, and it was a joy. It's a joy. Well, that's fun. Yeah. Hey, look, I am in the process of uh, planning uh, my middle son's birthday. His birthday is next week. Birthday parties coming up uh, uh, a af- f- few days after that, and immediately I was like, "Well, what, what, like, do you want cake, cupcakes? Like, what's the big thing after the activity is over? You're gonna be in the house. What is, what is it you want me to serve to your friends?" He's like, "Cupcakes, obviously," and I was like, "Yeah, great, vanilla chocolate. Okay, great, because uh, he likes options." I'm like, "Great, great, I can handle that," but then I'm like, "Ah." Oh, his best friend can't have gluten. So then I start looking into gluten-free cupcakes and it, it was going to cost me like a hundred bucks for the two dozen I wanted. So I was like, oh, I don't know. So then I came up with this idea. What if we get like a bunch of kinds of ice cream and set up a whole station of different, like so many toppings and we just make a Sunday bar and every kid can like put whatever they ha- want on their own thing. Then we don't have to worry about the gluten in some of the things. I know some we would, but I'm like, and then we're golden. So I, I mentioned it and he's like sold on it. He's like immediately. Yes. Well, the invites went out today and the best friend can't make it. <laughs> Which is the story of my life. But I get, I, so I was like, are you sure you don't want to just do cupcakes? <laughs> and he's like, oh no. The Sunday oh, bar. Now you've sold me on something that will probably cost you a hundred dollars anyway after oh. you get all the toppings. <laughs> Easy, because I've started a list. Yep. And inner child Christy is making that list. Cause I'm like, oh, you just get like a couple of different syrups, a couple of different ice creams, and then like, I don't know, mini marshmallows, chocolate chips, sprinkles, and then you're good. After you add maraschino cherries, maybe some fruity pebbles. <laughs> oh, maybe I should make some uh, eggless cookie dough and turn it into cookie dough bites. Oh, mini Reese's, Reese's Pieces, mini Smarty. Like, I'm just like, it. the list is lengthy. That hundred bucks, I should have just said, here's my hundred dollars. Please give me cupcakes. Give I'm not complaining about the price. I understand to make things uh, gluten-free, it's a whole other situation so i understand they're uh they're gonna make they need to you know they need to make the money uh and what they're worth i get that i was just shocked because i'm very lucky that i don't really have any allergies in my home that i have to deal with yeah with exception to my husband being allergic to cats um and i bring cats into the home and he has a prescription that says tough titties (laughs) I love that. That's that's a that's a no bull doctor. You know what I'm that, saying? That is in my defense. He had brought in cats first, so that gave me that. Of course, that showed me it. M- Mama said that it was okay. You know, because <laughs> you know, you and I like to have full conversations in just TikTok audios. I was on a drive the other day, very quickly because we got to get into it. Of course. And I literally went into Apple Music playlist before I left because I was like, I'm I'm driving. It was like an hour long drive alone. And I was oh. like, what am I gonna what am I gonna listen to? I wanted music. I didn't want a podcast. I wanted music. And I literally searched TikTok viral. And was it a joy? Song after song, I recognized. I it felt like this is the new radio. Yeah. TikTok killed the radio star. Anyway, hey. on that note, um, listen, let's get into it. This is a whole new kind of episode. This yeah. is one of our our, <laughs> our new series of episodes. It's, it's called The Missing Series. Do you want to just tell the listeners very quickly what was your inspiration for this? Uh, I will 
uh, get into a little slight more detail about it? Probably not. I don't remember. Again, it was early in the morning when I finished these notes. So of this course. could go anywhere. But uh, I was researching a case months ago. And it was a case where I couldn't find a lot of documentaries on. And I found one specific doc on it. So I watched it. But it was like, a it's on this case and a second case. So, of course, I end up invested in the second case and it was uh this young girl who had gone missing in kentucky and so i was like oh maybe that should be an episode of the show but i looked into it and i'm like oh there's just not a lot of information and by the time i give the information and then we talk about it it's like it wouldn't even be maybe half an hour in the show right and we can't start putting out like mini episodes because we don't have the time to do so many mini episodes so I was like yes. oh I guess we'll just never kind of cover that on the show that's too bad it seems interesting it would be interesting to chat with you about it and then all of a sudden my brain was like huh well what other kind of cases in Kentucky would be too short to put in uh, a regular episode and then it somehow turned into what if I do episodes where we focus on missing people who have not been found, focus on a specific state or province or country or whatever, and just kind of the kind of cases that we wouldn't normally do on this show, specifically based on there's just no information out there right. about it. But for the sake of, you know, highlighting it and telling people about them and that sort of thing. And I mentioned it to you and you were like, yeah. Yeah. That, that that why not and then we started talking season four and i was like well if we're doing season four i bring this in we're bringing in new things sticking with old things trying new kind of all these things and so i'm like well we'll just we'll give her a go see how this goes and it also helps me check off my list because i have gotten it into my head around episode 70 ish that I would like to cover a case in every state and every province uh, and as many countries in the world as possible. Um, I know that's not realistic, but uh, this week helped me uh, highlight off Kentucky. <laughs> well, fly free, little darling. Here we go. We're going to get into it. This, of yeah. course, the episode is Missing Kentucky. I love this whole concept, Christy curating. Uh, which is my favorite thing that she does on this show. So we're going to jump right in. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons Database, more than 600,000 people go missing in the United States every year. As of July 2022, there are 248 active missing persons cases in the state of Kentucky. Christy has chosen to highlight nine of those cases to help shine some light on cases that might not normally make it to our show. So get ready for more suspicious boyfriends, more psychologist hat diagnoses, and more complaints about law enforcement as we delve into Missing Kentucky. That was also really difficult to figure out because I'm like, I can't mention everybody in that or it'll just feel like it's a lot. And then I was oh, like, I, I don't know what to do. And then once I figured that out, I went, maybe I can just use that as a template for the next missing episode. I think it's a banger opening. I'm into well, it. I, oh, she is who she is, folks. And the answer is structured. Yep. So, as always, new type of episode or not, disclaimer, right out the gate. This episode will contain mentions of sexual assault, substance abuse, and suicide. So trigger warning for those who need it. Now, since this is a new style of episode, it's going to be formatted a little bit differently. Um, I just knew if we started at the top and just went into all of the cases, by the time we get to the end, it could get confusing about what we were talking about. So we're going to get into so many, talk about them, and kind of have our chats about it throughout it so that it hopefully flows a little better Love forever it. a producer you know, always. So Heather Danielle Teague was born April 25th, 1972 to Sarah Teague. She was friendly, smart, and according to her family, had a bright future. On August 26th, 1995, Heather was abducted 
while sunbathing at Newburgh Beach, a sandy area along the Ohio River in Spotsville, Kentucky. An eyewitness spotted a man approach Heather, put a gun to her head, and force her into the nearby woods. The man was described as a Caucasian male, approximately six feet tall, 210 to 230 pounds, with a bushy brown beard and brown hair that may or may not have been a wig. The suspect had no shirt, but was wearing jean shorts and black athletic shoes. The incident happened sometime after 12 p.m., but wasn't reported to the authorities until 12.45 p.m. Why did the witness eyewitness take so long to report the crime? Probably because the eyewitness only saw the incident happen because he was being a peeping Tom. Oh, no. That's right. The eyewitness was across the river on the Indiana side, scanning the Kentucky side of the beach with his telescope. After the police were finally notified, officers responded to the area and found footprints leading to the woods. When they followed the footprints, they found a towel and the bottom of a red plaid bikini, which was later uh, determined to belong to Heather. Police were able to confirm Heather's identity after they located her 1990 red Nissan. The area was thoroughly searched using sniffer dogs, a helicopter with infrared equipment, and divers in the river. Sniffer dogs picked up Heather's scent, but it ended at the woods. No sign of Heather Teague has ever been found. Heather was just 23 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 5 foot 2, 90 to 100 pounds, with brown hair and green eyes. Heather also had scoliosis, which caused a curving of her spine. Heather allegedly had a history of substance abuse and erratic behavior. Just two weeks before her disappearance, she was reported missing, only to be located several days later. Heather said she was just running around, but she had no arrest record and had never gone, been gone long for any, had never been gone for any great length before. A farmer who lived near the beach hired a local resident to videotape people who drove into the area because he wanted to catch whoever was responsible for tearing up his cornfields. On one of those videos, Heather is seen driving into the area, parking her car, and walking to the beach. A red Ford Bronco is also seen on camera arriving just after 12 p.m. and parking near Heather's vehicle. Due to the sun's reflection, it is difficult to determine how many people were in the vehicle when it left, and police were unable to corroborate whether the exact vehicle was involved in Heather's disappearance. The man who saw Heather being abducted spoke with police and helped to get two composite sketches made of the suspect. After they were released to the public, numerous people called to say the sketch looked just like a 30-year-old man named Marvin Ray Dill, who was known as Marty, for whatever reason. Okay. In 1992, Dill made obscene phone calls to a former high school classmate. The woman said she would return home after dates with her then-boyfriend, now-husband, and Dill would call her and describe the exact outfit she had worn out that night which is terrifying. Uh, These calls continued for months. So already things are a little off with Dill. Yeah. Dill also happened to drive a 1985 Red Ford Bronco. There we go. Just like the one in the video. And in February 1995, months before Heather's disappearance, Dill was pulled over during a routine traffic stop. In the car, police found two knives two guns, rubber gloves, rope, a roll of duct tape, and blood stains on the inside of his tailgate. But since this happened months before Heather's disappearance, I know that it could be nothing, but to me, it could also potentially mean another unknown victim. Yeah. But many people say these items aren't suspicious because Dill was a hog farmer which could explain some of the items in the truck, including the blood. But I'm still skeptical about that. 
maybe we've been doing this show too long. Maybe that's just who I am. Then on April 24th, 1995, Dill pleaded guilty to felony cultivation of marijuana, possession of marijuana, and possession of drug paraphernalia after being caught with a 13-plant grow-up. He was sentenced to five years in jail, but somehow was released after just 40 days under some sort of plea bargain. So Mm. if Dill was responsible for Heather's disappearance, knowing that he should have been in jail at the time of her disappearance is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. According to police records, Dill's vehicle was determined to be at the scene So police obtained a search warrant on August 31st, 1995 for both Dill's vehicle and his residence. When officers arrived at 2 a.m., Dill allegedly told his wife to leave the house. After she left, Dill shot himself in the head. He was taken to Henderson Methodist Community Hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 3.15 a.m. Dill's wife was later called as a witness at a grand jury hearing, uh, but she invoked her Fifth Amendment right over questions regarding Heather Teague's disappearance, which means she chose not to answer in case she incriminated herself. Well, wait, and he's dead at this point. Yep. Okay. Yep. I just want to say, what does she know? Well, it's... Nope, I'm not going to answer anything. It's like I have I I have a lot to say. Uh, but some people are skeptical as to whether Marvin Dill was involved in Heather's disappearance at all. Some believe the real suspect is Christopher J. Bello, who was originally from Henderson, Kentucky. In 2004, he pled guilty to a firearms violation and attempted involuntary manslaughter in the 1991 death of Kathy Fetzer. His guilty plea was part of a plea agreement, which allowed Bellow to avoid a trial, as well as the possibility of life in prison. He was sentenced to 11 to 18 years in prison. Bellow admitted to shooting Kathy and putting her body in a dumpster but he couldn't recall which one. And as such, Kathy's body has never been found. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that he outright admitted to doing it and was like, oh, I absolutely killed her. And the fact that they went, you know what? Attempted involuntary manslaughter. Yeah. I don't know what's involuntary about killing someone and putting them in a dumpster. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that I flipped and I was like... I I just tried to read this page one all over again. Again, she's barely alive. So Kathy and Bello were co-workers, but it was believed that they were having an affair. Kathy's husband later confirmed the affair after finding a love letter written by Bello in their home. In November 1991, in Medina, Ohio, Kathy left her husband a note saying she was going to the mall. Her car was found locked 20 miles or 32 kilometers away on Route 83. There was no sign of a struggle, no fingerprints, no bloodstains, nothing of that sort. A friend of Bellow's later admitted that he helped Bellow move a blue Ford Tempo, the same make and model that Kathy drove. The friend said Bellow told him it was a gift for his wife and it was a surprise. Mm. Mm. At the time... Christopher Bello was married. People described him as charismatic, but with a real Jekyll and Hyde personality, and that he couldn't handle rejection. Bello had five ex-wives by the time he was arrested in 2003. Interesting. And just in case you aren't convinced that something is off about Bello, in the late 90s, he got a chest tattoo of two women. One is beautiful with long, dark hair, and the other has horns. Bello said, quote, This is the way women are. When you meet her, she's all nice and sweet. Later, she turns into a blood-sucking whore. Wowzer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's shocking that those five women wanted out. Yeah. Uh, Two weeks after Kathy's disappearance, Bellow sold a 38 pistol to a pawn shop in Barberton, 
which is about 16 miles or 35 kilometers southeast of Medina. Bello had originally purchased the gun at a gun show in Medina just 17 days before Kathy's disappearance. Bello gave conflicting stories about his relationship with Kathy early in the investigation, but for whatever reason, he wasn't seen as a serious suspect until he was arrested in November 2003. Bello said he shot Kathy because she played head games. Kathy was 26 at the time of her murder. Bello was also 26 at the time. And since Heather and Kathy were a similar height, weight, hair color, some people believe that Bello could be responsible for Heather's disappearance, especially when Bello was in Kentucky in August 1995 and left abruptly soon after Heather's disappearance. Investigators believe they have circumstantial evidence that links Bello to the crime, and they've even suggested that Bello and Dill may have been working together, but there has been no evidence that links those two men to each other. Many believe Bello is also responsible for the disappearances of 18-year-old Shailene Farrell, who went missing in Piqua, Ohio in August 1994, 43-year-old Mary Cushto, who went missing from St. Cloud, Florida in May 1998, and 16-year-old Christina Porco, who went missing from Hilton Head, South Carolina in November 1986. There has been nothing official that has linked Bello to any of these crimes, but in 1992, his sister allegedly found a missing poster for Christina Porco in Bello's suitcase, along with the missing posters of other young women. Bello was incarcerated at North Central Correctional Institution in Ohio until November 13th, 2021. His current whereabouts are unknown. Today, he'd be about 56 years old. That's chilling. Yeah. Yeah, I did care for that. Did care for that. No. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We're going to find a lot of things we don't care about throughout this. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, In February 2013, Heather's mother, Sarah Teague, filed a lawsuit against the local, state, and federal authorities alleging a cover-up and malfeasance. She believes that Dill was the wrong man and police neglected to follow up on other leads because they were too busy focused on Dill. Sarah also stated, quote, I have FBI files which say that Heather's abduction is linked to drugs, prostitution, public corruption, and strip clubs. I'd love to know where they got any of that information. Yeah. Uh, And she said that in 2009, she was told that Heather had been sold and that one of the men involved admitted Heather was with him in 1998, three years after her disappearance. But of course, her mother was never given any proof of any of these things. In 2018, Sarah was awarded $24,000 because a judge found that the police had violated Kentucky's Open Records Act by failing to release 911 calls after Heather's family requested them. In 2008, Sarah and her lawyer listened to the 911 call from the man who claimed to witness the abduction. The call described the abductor as having mosquito netting or a wig over his head. They listened to the call twice and then requested a copy. They were finally able to hear the tape again in 2016. Mosquito netting is never mentioned in that call. Also, the call they heard in 2008, the 911 dispatcher was male. In the 2016 version, the dispatcher was female. The state police agree that Sarah and her lawyer heard the 911 call in both 2008 and 2016, but say there was only ever one version of the call. That's chilling. On October 22nd, 2021, human remains were found near the Ohio River in the same area where Heather was last seen. A dental comparison has since determined the remains did not belong to Heather Teague. So to this day, they still don't know. But wow, I have a lot of questions about the 911 call but yeah you know uh we'll uh we'll get into our into our thoughts shortly because uh 
I guess I I guess one thing I meant to say off the top, which I might have, I genuinely don't remember, and it's been under an hour. This is a problem. Um, obviously, I some of these some cases will be talked about more than others based on how much information is available. Some it's going to seem like we're talking about it forever. Some it's going to seem like I like say it in a second and we move on. It's just there's just so little information about some of them. And it's a case of I either just don't mention them at all, which doesn't seem fair if the whole point is to try and get out these ones that are currently unsolved and haven't been found and that kind of thing. So if I'm going to do it, I got to do it right, even if it means of course, the only information out there is a paragraph. You know what I'm 100%. saying? 100%. Yep. So that's the only reason I'm not playing favorites. I just see that's how much of a mother I am <laughs> where I'm like, I have to let my kids know. Of I course. love you all the same. This is not about favoritism. It's about how much information is available uh, for me to be able to find. For example, Heather Teague, FBI has 340 pages. A lot of it's redacted, but files on her that you can access whereas uh these next two barely a website about them wow so it's just shocking to me how much can be about one person and how little can be about others but again this is about highlighting and i tried to get as many kind of people in there uh as i can so yes our second case involves lydia and perkins who was born December 20th, 1982, to Sherry Thompson. Lydia and her 12-year-old brother, Justin, were hanging out at Lydia's boyfriend's house. Justin left, and then Lydia left shortly after him. It is believed that Lydia made it to her house on Rugby Road, which is approximately 0.4 miles or 1.1 kilometers away, as Lydia called her cousin when she arrived home. I don't know if she actually spoke with her cousin or just attempted to make the call. Lydia was last seen on London Dairy Drive between 3 and 5 p.m. on October 26, 1997. She has not been seen or heard from since. Her family reported her missing hours later. Since they don't know when she may have left or where she may have been headed, there is very little for the investigation to go on. Uh, for the first two years of the investigation, however, police considered Lydia just to be a runaway, as she had been known for leaving her house without permission. However, whenever she did leave, she didn't go outside of the Cardinal Valley neighborhood where both her and her boyfriend lived. Lydia was just 14 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 4 foot 11, 90 pounds, with red hair and hazel eyes. She had scars on the center of her forehead and her right eyebrow, as well as a brown circular birthmark on the right side of her neck. And yes, again, to my point, it was not a lot of information, but somehow... Her case is just not really out there. Uh, there's not a lot of people that have anything, I think, because it just seems she was just gone and they wasted two years. I'll say it. The cops wasted two years. Yep. So third case, the last one of this section. Sadly, there's even less about him. Terry Hand was born in early 1971. He enjoyed fishing, hunting, and DJing. Terry was last seen January 6, 2013 in Walton, Kentucky. His Ford Mustang was parked outside his home at 151 Longleaf Court near Florence, Kentucky, about nine miles or 15 kilometers north of Walton. Both Terry's house and car were undisturbed and there were, was no sign of a struggle. However, police suspect foul play, as everyone they spoke to said this was uncharacteristic of Terry, especially since he didn't call in to work. Terry was 41 at the time of his disappearance, which police described as gone without a trace. Terry was described as a Caucasian male, 6'4", 300 pounds, 
with shoulder-length brown hair and brown eyes. He also had a beard and a star tattoo on his left hand. Wow. The fact that one, that Lydia is red hair and hazel eyes, and I'm like, huh, same. And then Terry has a star tattoo on his left hand. And I was like, well, I have a star tattoo on my on my left. It's just, yeah. it's a weird like, huh. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Weird yeah. synchronicity. Wow. Well, listen, I mean, let's just work our way backwards. Maybe I'll, because yeah. again, there's, there's little there. It's interesting because he was a big guy, six foot four, six 300 pounds. That's four. That's how a do you just go missing guy yep. to, to go be, you know, and I mean, as everyone knows on this show, I am, what I'm about to say is in no way meant to sound crass, but when it's children or in some of these other cases, we're talking about uh, women who are, you know, um, smaller or the perpetrators are bigger. Uh, yeah. you, we don't bat an eye because it's like, well, you know, that's that's just the way it is. But we're talking about a gentleman who's six foot four, 300 pounds. That's going to take some that's going to take at least somebody that big. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like that just narrows the field of like. Yeah. Who, who could even be behind this? Because again, if it's an accident, if it's if it's something like that, it you would just think that, that that there would be some trace or the person would be found. The fact that his car was untouched, his house was untouched, there's no kind of sign anywhere. That's a chilling one to me because again, that's a big guy to just yeah. disappear into nowhere. You oh. don't hear about those cases a lot, is my oh. point. Oh, oh, a hundred percent. That one to me immediately read as he a friend or someone close to him was like hey i'll come get you and they went somewhere and they know exactly what happened and they've yeah. chosen not to say anything yeah yeah it feels like it i mean again because that's just i mean that's wild um lydia perkins this is also interesting because I mean, listen, of course, the first thing that comes to mind anytime I hear the police said, oh, it was probably just a runaway. Of Ugh. course, I have flashbacks to Gacy. That is that is burned yeah. in my brain and will be until the day I die. As you all know, dear listeners, or if you weren't listening then, I became a changed person after my week I spent researching Gacy. Um, but that was just the, the, the thing across the board. The police said over and over again to these parents that were like, that's not my kid. Oh, it's probably he just ran away. He just ran away. He just ran away. And then, of course, that was very tragically not the case. So that's like a huge, for lack of a better term, that's a huge trigger for me. Anytime I hear that, I'm just like, to your point, you've just wasted yeah. time. Yeah, you've just wasted time. And I understand that. Re I get that resources can be tough. I totally get that. But, you know, I just feel like what a world where we can't try and find some priority, because even if. I mean, what a relief it would be that it would have been a waste of time to look for her. Wouldn't that have been a relief? Yes. And what's the I worst mean, I case? Would say, you go looking, you find out she was a runaway, and you found her and brought her home. That's what I'm saying. And why not put into place then some sort of charge? Then then, then make it so you can charge her or something. You know what I mean? Like make some yes. sort of deterrent system if you're so worried about wasting time. I don't believe in that personally. Sure. But I'm saying from that point of view... You know what I mean? Like, yes, it should be an, it should be enough that that she was found alive and and what a gift, obviously, and that's where I align. But I'm just talking from the other side where it's like if if you're so concerned about not having the resources, then I don't know, find another way around it. Like, I just feel like we should be we should be you know investigating anyone, especially any child, any yes. child that goes missing. My God, yes, it's overwhelming. Anyway, um. And yeah, again, just to like disappear without a trace, it's 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 chilling, and and I my heart breaks for that family. Um, okay, interesting story here with Heather Teague. The first thing it's so interesting too. You said there was the video on the farmer's property of her car pulling up, and then yeah. the red Bronco pulling up after. And immediately, I wrote down stalker. And then the next thing you said about Marvin Ray Dill was he had basically been stalking this other woman. Yep. Because he had been making these phone calls and was able to say what she was wearing and whatnot. Right. It's interesting because, I mean, this one is a 
there's it's very difficult not to put on a conspiracy hat on this one because of the the recording nine one one yeah and that it's more than one person right it's her it's her attorney the mom's attorney and her right more than yeah. one person is saying oh no this is different this is not what we heard before yep that chills me to my core i literally have yep. goosebumps like that is the creepiest thing i've ever heard because listen before starting this podcast if you had said to me human trafficking i would have said okay slow down that's a bit of a myth we're you know whatever I, no it's not what year were we talking here 95 i think you'd be yep. shocked again hate to reference it but the week I spent with Gacy, <laughs> but I mm -hmm. learned so much about the stuff that was going on in these years prior to the internet that would make your heads spin. And, and truly like the stuff that people fear now that isn't happening is nothing in comparison to the shit that was going on back then that we now have proof was happening, if that makes any yeah. sense. So yeah. honestly, there's part of me that, that when you went there, I was like, it could be possible. I, I, again, nothing would surprise me after doing this show for a year and a half. Nothing would surprise me. And yep. I'm going to say something, and I hate the words that are about to come out of my mouth because it makes me feel sick. Uh, but again, this is coming from a place of we're, we're presenting the facts and the theories and whatnot. We talk about it. Of course. She was a, she was a, a smaller woman. She yeah. was a young, smaller woman. I want to take a shower, the fact that I've even said it. But from these what we know of or, or certainly what i learned about the the boy scout troop oh god yep shit that was going on uh during the gacy time um it just feels like i could see a world in which this wasn't completely random that she had been being watched that she had been being stalked they waited until she was somewhere where she could be taken um again it's just I mean, oh. from my understanding, it was like it was a very well-known area that sunbathers would go. She would often go there. So I wouldn't be surprised. It takes one time for her to go there that they are him, they, whoever it was, yeah. happens to see her and takes a shine to her. Yep. From a distance. Because she yep. was by herself too, right? Yes. Yeah. My God. Terrifying. Um, now, I have a question here. Yes. So there was blood found in his truck. Yeah. We know that this was before she went missing. Yes. And the justification was that he was a hog farmer. Yeah. Was the blood tested? And, Not and my, that I know of. My follow-up question is this. I know that you need to get warrants. I understand how the... I, I, I get how the system works, and the system is there for a good reason. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't have had to get a warrant. I think that denotes a warrant. I think if you find blood in a yeah. truck, I think maybe test it. I think yeah. maybe get the warrant. And I think maybe if it's difficult to get that warrant, there's no probable cause, et cetera. I think finding blood inside a truck, yeah. like where, like, again, like depending on, not depending on, are you just throwing dead, dead hogs all through your truck? Like, no, I think if there's blood found when, if there has been enough of a reason to stop that car and there was other things found in that car that were suspicious, to yeah. me, that should be enough to get a warrant solely to test that blood. I'm not saying you got a warrant to, to tear this guy's house apart, to go through his property. I'm not saying that. Sure. But I think that should be enough for a judge to say, yeah, swab it. Let's test and see if it's human. I think that's fair. And I would be fine yes. if, it was, if somebody, if you're listening, you're not going to find any blood in my car. I'm not hauling hogs. But you know what I'm saying? Like, like to me, I don't think that that violates rights. If, if again, yeah. I'm not suggesting that you 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 find something suspicious and then, you know. Again, but these are the things where we just throw want to slam our heads into walls because it's like you could have stopped this crime potentially. He could have been behind yeah. Heather's um, abduction. Yeah. But then, of course, I go, well, why was the tape changed? And then, of course, then I start to, again, sound like I'm going to put on a tinfoil hat because it starts to feel like it's a, it's a giant conspiracy. Oh, it's hard not to feel crazy yeah. when you're, you're, I mean, uh, to your point, when before we started this, I was like, oh, yeah, no, that that only happens in movies. And then all of a sudden something happens and I immediately go, oh, no, it's this crazy thing. You think it's not, but it is like it's just I am so quick now to be like, oh, I don't believe that. Yeah. The tapes, other way. Tapes yeah. can be faked. Oh, yeah. There are so many things I just. 
my my question is, what was it about the mosquito netting that had to be taken out of the tape? Was it was the mosquito netting obscuring his face? Did you take that out so they'd hear it and be like, see, this it absolutely points out that it was Dill because the sketch looks like him. Or flip it. Was yeah. the first tape the fake one? Interesting. Okay. Was this eyewitness paid yeah. off? Was his account fake? It's possible. Right? Like it's again, it's, but this is how it starts to unravel, right? Because yep. it's like, you it, again, to quote my favorite television show of all time, trust no one. You can't trust any of it. When you start to go, yeah. oh, well, some of this could be a lie. You have to operate from the place that any of it or all of it could be a lie. And the yeah. big thing that sticks out to me, why is there a 341 page FBI report? Most of which, as you pointed out, is redacted. So it's mostly yep. useless. 341 pages for an abducted gal. Um, yeah, I wish that there was 341 pages for every person that got abducted. I think sure. that it would be great if the yes. FBI was trying to get involved. But what I will say, again, having done this for not that long, but enough that, again, it's it's hardened us. Um, yeah. There isn't 341 pages, not for a reason. Sorry. Yeah. The FBI? No. Yeah. A, that, to me, that is the big smoking gun in that the details of what you brought. The fact that the FBI was paying close enough attention to have that much documented. Yeah. And then you add in the 911 call tape had been changed. And then you add in that there was accusations that human trafficking could have been at play. Yeah. Again, there was there was absolutely FBI files about the Kate, the Gacy stuff. Like, and I hate, but but yeah. again, I just see the parallels again. Like there was knowledge of what was happening with these human trafficking rings there was knowledge about it but things weren't happening and it wasn't being stopped so i again i offer that because it just feels like there's some real some real parallels um yes and, and i also want to know yeah this ha this ha heather was taken on a like just after noon on a day in august at a beach you can't tell me it was an empty beach. Yeah, no one else saw this. Not another single person saw it. But really? someone from a from another state who is technically across state lines, doesn't yep. that feel convenient? Yeah. It, yeah, there's something like how long were you watching her? I, but was that person like now of course I'm along the lines that that person either doesn't exist or was paid off? or was paid to, to tell a fake story. Because to me, if you're in different state lines, can that person be compelled to come to court for, for a crime that happened in a different state? And I bet you there's Interesting. some, right? And I don't know, because I don't know the ins and outs of Kentucky law. Of course. But you know what I'm saying? Like when you start to look at those little details, it starts to feel more and more like it's like nothing, everything, nothing is random. It feels like when it comes to this case anyway, it sounds to me like there's a lot happening there. Oh, there's something. And again, I I will probably say this multiple times throughout this episode, but nothing horrifies me quite like just never been found. Yeah. No sign. How is that physically possible? Well, like, yeah, I mean... We we hear it again. We hear it uh, time and again here. But uh, I mean, I, that's why we're doing the episode again. I'm, I'm uh, or or this whole series because it is confounding at best. Well, listen, we're a third of the way through. Let's take a yeah. break. Uh, get another drink. Hit the can, and we're going to be back with more on our inaugural missing episode, missing Kentucky, on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, clap two. Yep. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're talking missing Kentucky. We've had the first three cases. What you got now? Oh boy. Well, we are going to head right in to the case of Crystal Rogers. Crystal, now I've seen it Marie and I've seen it Maria. 
so I'm not 100% which way we're going. Rogers was born April 4th, 1980 to Tommy and Sherry Ballard. Crystal was nice to everyone she met and a loving mother to five children aged 15, 14, 12, 11, and two. At the time, Crystal was living with her children and her boyfriend, Brooks Hauk, who was the father of Crystal's youngest son, Eli. They were living in Bardstown, Kentucky, which is approximately 40 miles or 64 kilometers south of Louisville. Crystal was last seen by Brooks on July 3rd, 2015. Brooks claims that Crystal was, quote, on her phone playing games when he went to bed around midnight. When he woke up the next morning, both Crystal and her car were gone. Brooks said this wasn't unusual, as Crystal occasionally spent the night at a cousin's house. When Crystal's mother, Sherry, couldn't get a hold of Crystal, she reported Crystal missing two days later. Brooks never reported Crystal missing. Mm -hmm. On July 5th, Crystal's red 2007 Chevy Impala was discovered in Bardstown on the Bluegrass Parkway near mile marker 14. The car had a flat tire and the keys were still in the ignition. Crystal's cell phone and purse were found inside. For some reason, no items from Crystal's car were ever booked into evidence. Crystal was 35 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 5'9", 150 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. On July 8th, police interviewed Brooks, but partway through his interview, his brother, Nick Houck, called to tell Brooks not to speak with the officers, saying the cops are going to try and trip him up. How did he know that? Well, because at the time, Nick was a Bardstown police officer. Stop. The next day, on July 9th, Brooks did an interview with Nancy Grace, where he admitted his relationship with Crystal was stressed, but he said he had nothing to do with her disappearance. A direct quote from Brooks, quote, I am 100% completely innocent in this, which is a great way to not sound innocent. <laughs> yeah, but again, maybe I've just been doing this job for too long. And as, as my faithful companion said earlier, trust no one. Trust no one. But if we're going to talk about quotes from Brooks, I have to mention this one because it's just him talking in circles. And yes, this is a serious, exact quote. I had to listen to it multiple times to make sure I was getting it exact. Quote, I don't have anything to say. I really don't have anything to say. I really don't have anything to say because I don't know anything. So I really don't have anything to say. Okay. I mean, for someone who has nothing to say, you're screaming. Yeah. Yeah. You've said a lot with nothing yeah. to say. Yeah. Uh, Nick was later interviewed July 15th. And I bet you're wondering, why did it take so many days to question him? Well, that's because Nick was asked to come in for an interview, and he originally refused. This is his brother? Yeah. This is the mm -hmm. cop brother. Yeah. He eventually agreed to come in and even agreed to take a polygraph test on July 24th, which he failed. <laughs> but if you ask Nick about that polygraph test, quote, I don't give a goddamn what your fucking computer said. You're calling me a fucking liar, and I don't like when people call me a liar. Which feels like the perfect temperament for a police officer to have. Yeah, wow. Brooks also took a polygraph test. His results were inconclusive. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Since Nick uh, failed that polygraph test, he was placed on a one-month suspension which ultimately led to Nick being fired on October 16th, 1995. The reason given for his dismissal was that Nick interfered with an ongoing investigation. That same day, Brooks was officially named a suspect in the case, and police publicly announced 
that they believed that Crystal was dead. On December 16th, 2015, 53-year-old Danny Singleton, one of Brooks' employees and close friends, was charged with 38 counts of perjury during a grand jury testimony regarding Crystal's disappearance. After pleading guilty, Danny spent six months in jail and was released in July 2016. I really, really wish that more information about that had come out. Yeah. A private investigator found that a white Buick was parked in a peculiar location on the Hauk family farm on the night that Crystal disappeared. And coincidentally, Brooks's 82-year-old grandmother, Anna Whitesides, owned a white Buick at the time. However, Anna sold the car just weeks after Crystal went missing. Anna was subpoenaed to testify in front of a grand jury, but she refused. The car was later searched by police and released. In August 2016, police searched Anna's house as well as the home of Nick Houck. Police also used 14 cadaver dogs to complete two searches of all 300 acres of the Houck family farm. Nothing from those searches has been released publicly. In July 2017, Brooks' new girlfriend, Crystal Maupin, don't be confused about the fact that his second, the girlfriend after was also named Crystal, was caught on gas station surveillance cameras ripping up signs that said, standing with the Ballards, the Ballards being Crystal's parents. Of course. She was charged with unlawful taking, but didn't seem to get any sort of serious punishment. She outright admitted to taking and destroying multiple signs, which is a terrible look when you're dating the main suspect. Yeah. I also tried desperately to find out when they started dating because I'm the most fascinated in that timeline, but I couldn't find anything. Uh, In 2020, FBI out of Louisville took over the investigation and issued multiple warrants to search three properties belonging to Nick and Brooks Houck. Over 150 agents arrived in town, nearly 50 interviews were conducted, and nine federal warrants were served. The FBI conducted a search in Bardstown in August 2020 and August 2021. One of the searches involved the Woodlawn Springs subdivision where Brooks Construction Company had built houses around the time of Crystal's disappearance. They did not disclose their findings publicly, but on August 27, 2021, the FBI announced they had recovered items of interest from the concrete driveway of one of the homes. Several items were sent to a lab in Virginia, and cadaver dogs were brought in to search the scene. In August 2018, Brooks was indicted on four felony counts and four misdemeanor counts of theft after being accused of taking more than 200 bundles of roofing shingles from a Lowe's in Nelson County. Brooke was eventually acquitted, but ordered to have no further contact with Lowe's. The idea that it's like, oh, no, you probably didn't do it. And then it was like, but never contact them again. Never go near a Lowe's again. Feels what did you do? Did you did you take the bundles? Well, yeah. I mean, he has a construction company, so. Well, he also has a cop brother. So well, I don't know what to say. He did until he got fired. Well, yes, yeah. but but you know what I mean. Like he's still Oh yeah, he knows l- known locally. Of course. Uh over the years, there has been a battle between Brooks and Crystal's mother, Sherry, over the custody of Crystal's youngest son. Brooks was eventually awarded sole custody, but Sherry was given visitation rights. But sadly, in February 2022, a panel ruled that it was harmful for the child to see his grandmother due to the tension between Sherry and Brooks. Therefore, the original visitation order was reversed and Sherry was no longer able to see her grandson. That also means that the child's four older siblings were not allowed to see him either. Uh, The four older ones were living with Sherry at the time. It's just heartbreaking for me for all of these children involved, especially the youngest, 
who is currently about like eight or nine at this point. So I can't even imagine what that poor kid has gone through. I don't eat. Okay. I'll save it, but I don't even know. That's shocking. Yeah. Uh, But speaking of heartbreaking and things that are shocking, uh, just 16 months after Crystal's disappearance on November 19th, 2016, at 7.54 a.m., Crystal's 54-year-old father, Tommy Ballard, was fatally shot. Tommy had been hunting on his own farm, private property, with Crystal's 12-year-old son when Tommy was shot in the chest once. Police ruled out suicide as Tommy's gun was never fired and the grandson was cleared of any foul play. Police have not stated if the grandson had seen anything, but leading up to his death, Tommy allegedly told his wife Sherry he believed he was being followed. Wow. Yep. Crystal and Tommy's cases are just two of the four unsolved murder cases that occurred in Bardstown, which as of 2019 had a population of just over 13,000. On April 22nd, 2014, 48-year-old Kathy Netherland and her 16-year-old daughter, Samantha, were killed in their own home. Kathy was shot multiple times and Samantha was bludgeoned. Both suffered knife wounds to their necks. On May 25th, 2013, police officer Jason Ellis was shot multiple times on his way home from work. Crystal's mother suggested that maybe Crystal overheard something she shouldn't have about the death of Officer Jason Ellis, since Nick Houck was a police officer at the time. That is, of course, speculation. Right. I do find it interesting, though, that Jason was murdered in 2013. Kathy and her daughter were murdered in 2014. Crystal goes missing and is presumed murdered in 2015, and her father is murdered in 2016. And maybe it's not the pattern of a killer. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But I can't. When I see a murder happen every year for multiple years straight in a small her sized town, it just, again, we've been doing this too long. Immediately, I'm like, what's up with that? Something feels right. It feels right. Something feels weird about it. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of weird coincidences, side note. Crystal's aunt, Frida Shireen Ballard, known as Sherry, went missing from Bardstown in 1979. Sherry was 19 years old and seven months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. Her body was found in August 1983 on a farm near the spot where Crystal's car was located several years later. Whoa. Yeah. Sherry's estranged husband, Edsel Barnes, and his friend, George Weir, were convicted of Sherry's murder and sentenced to life in prison. So I just find it in a, again, not the smallest, but in a smaller sized town, multiple murders are happening and three happened in one family. Again, I know we don't know for sure what has happened to Crystal, and I've been continuously alluding that most likely she had been murdered, but I mean, is there the hope that she's just she just took off and is out there living her life? Of course. Do I believe that a mother of five children would just leave them and be like, nah, it's fine, and never come back for no reason, out of the blue? No, I, no. I, I do not believe that whatsoever. I understand a thing called hope, but I, I just, well, when you're becoming got, realistic about it, I yeah, guess. Yeah. When you've got saying. people falling, failing polygraphs and whatnot that are in law enforcement at the time. Also, it's, it doesn't, that doesn't uh, make me feel more hope. The law enforcement uh, part is, uh, yeah, it's upsetting. Now, uh, this next one. I want you to know, when it comes to pronunciations of places or people's names, I do my best to look them up in advance. Um, and there are, are usually names that I am I see it. I'm, for example, Crystal Rogers. I'm like, got it. Understood. 
uh, I read this young lady's name and I pronounced it one way. And then I went and I thought I will double check that. And every single news I found about it pronounced it a different way. And okay. I, so I just want people to know, I, I looked up how to pronounce this name. It may sound like, oh, she doesn't know what she's saying, but I promise you it surprised me. But I, again, I, when I fuck up a pronunciation, it's not after, it's not because I didn't do my best. Of course. So Andrea Michelle Knabel was born January 7th, 1982 to Mike and Sherry Knabel. She was known for her voluminous laugh, her fun personality, and her intelligence. She was a social butterfly who could make friends with anyone and a devoted mother to her sons who were six and eight at the time. I also want to point out that Andrea was the oldest of three with younger sisters, Aaron and then Sarah. On August 12, 2019, Andrea's sons were both with their respective fathers for the night. Around 8 p.m., Andrea had Chinese food at the Double Dragon restaurant with her mother, Cheryl, her sister, Sarah, Sarah's fiance, Ethan Bates, and Aaron's teenage son. The dinner turned into some sort of fight between Andrea and her mother, which turned into a larger fight with Andrea, Sarah, and Ethan. Andrea started to suffer a serious eczema breakout or some sort of infection on her face. So at 9.50 p.m., Ethan and the nephew took Andrea to Kentucky One Health Medical Center on Dutchman's Lane in Louisville. At 11.22 p.m., Andrea took a lift to her mother's house at 3113 Chickadee Road, arriving at 11.34 p.m. Something I would like to point out about the Chickadee House that I will call it, because let's face it, Chickadee is ridiculously fun to say. More fun than saying her mother's house. Andrea's mother owned the house, but wasn't living there at the time. A pipe in the upstairs bathroom burst, so Cheryl hired Ethan, who was a contractor, to fix the house. While renovating, Ethan and Sarah moved from their home in Lexington to live at the Chickadee House. And after being evicted, Andrea also moved in. So for about five or six weeks, Andrea, Ethan, and Sarah all shared that house together. Cheryl said that after six weeks of work, the grout wasn't even done yet in the bathroom. So work was slow going at best. Neighbors later said they often heard loud arguments coming from the house, and there were rumors that fist fights occurred. And apparently whatever argument they got into at the restaurant still hadn't subsided by the time Andrea returned to the house at 11.34 p.m. because Ethan and Sarah refused to let her in. Andrea banged on the door, but no one answered. Around 12.15 a.m., Andrea walked 1.2 miles or two kilometers to her sister Erin's house on Fincastle Road. An argument occurred between Andrea and Erin, and at 1.03 a.m., Erin drove Andrea back to the Chickadee house. Seven minutes later, Andrea texted Erin to say they won't let me in the house. So Erin picked her up again, took her to Erin's house. Andrea begged Erin just to let her stay at Erin's house but Aaron said no, so at 1.38 a.m., Andrea walked back to the house on Chickadee. Aaron said that when Andrea left her house, quote, she was pretty upset, pretty wound up when she left walking. Andrea arrived back at the house on Chickadee at 1.54 a.m., and at 2.12 a.m., she tried to FaceTime a friend, but they didn't answer. Now, Andrea's phone was active at the house until 6.31 a.m., but we don't know if she actually went inside or not. A private investigator later claims the actual time was closer to 3.53 a.m., but Andrea's cell phone either turned off or the battery died. When police later went to the house with a search warrant, they were unable to find 
Andrea's phone. To this day, neither Andrea nor her cell phone have ever been found. Andrea was 37 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as a Caucasian female, 5'7", 180 pounds, with brown hair and hazel eyes. She was last seen wearing a light-colored tank top, white shorts, and light-colored Nike shoes. Aaron, was, who was the last person to see Andrea, said, quote, she was calling her friends after she left my house because she was, wasn't ready to go to sleep. She was wanting to stay up and hang out and probably distract herself. People do that a lot when they're feeling overwhelmed. Aaron believes that Andrea got a hold of someone who took advantage of Andrea's trust. But why would Andrea feel overwhelmed, as Aaron had said? Well, Andrea was going through a very difficult time. In, two, uh, in 2017, she met 34-year-old Brian Downey. They moved in together in March 2018 and were engaged just a couple months later. On July 6, 2018, Brian was pulled over and found to have more than two grams of meth in his car. He was convicted of drug trafficking charges and sent to prison. At some point, they broke up, I assume, when he went to prison. Uh, but since then, Brian has uh, passed away in a car accident in January 2022. Oh, wow. But when Brian went to prison, uh, the two of them split up. Andrea then struggled with money and went into serious credit card debt. And in December 2018, she filed for bankruptcy for the second time in her adult life. Then in January 2019, Andrea's car broke down on a highway. So she had to leave it on the side of the road. And when she went back for it the next day or a few days later, she found that it had been hit by somebody who obviously wasn't paying attention and it totaled her car. Then in the spring, Andrea got evicted and then she was laid off from her job. So it was just kind of one hit after another for her in a very small span. Andrea's family started to worry about her mental health. They urged her to go to counseling, but that only made her angry. Aaron claimed that Andrea had multiple personalities and that she was struggling with substance abuse at the time of her disappearance. I cannot corroborate either of those details. In October 2019, there was a possible sighting of Andrea in Clarksville, Tennessee, about 180 miles or 291 kilometers southwest of Louisville. And on October 14th, two people claimed to have seen Andrea near a soup kitchen in Jeffersonville, Indiana, which is only like three miles or 4.8 kilometers northeast of Louisville. All three of these sightings were from eyewitness statements, and police were investigating to see if there were any nearby surveillance cameras that could have verified uh, that it was or was not Andrea. Uh, but I don't think that she would willingly walk away from her life. She was struggling, yes, but she was so dedicated to her children, and it was completely out of character for her to be away from them for any great length of time. There has been no activity on her bank accounts or financials. Uh, and while this whole case is sad, something I find particularly heartbreaking is that Andrea was an active member of Missing in America, which is a nonprofit group that volunteers to perform searches for missing children and adults. The idea that someone who volunteered her time to help find missing people goes missing herself just really adds to the sadness of the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, the fathers of Andrea's sons were both cleared as potential suspects, and Andrea's mother, Cheryl, helped with the search and has been helpful to police. Andrea's father, Mike, and her sister, Erin, have also both been very cooperative and have both done searches for Andrea almost daily. You know who never once helped look for Andrea? Sarah and Ethan. They claimed they were asleep when Andrea returned to the house that night, although someone who is familiar with that house uh, said that there is no way they wouldn't have been able to hear her banging on the door from where they were sleeping. Police cleared Sarah and Ethan at the time, 
but some sketchy things about Ethan. Apparently, he has a temper, according to uh, Andrea's father, Mike, and a police record for shoplifting and cocaine possession. Shortly after Andrea's disappearance, Sarah and Ethan allegedly painted Andrea's bedroom at the Chickadee House, which is interesting, and I wish I knew, did that need to be done because of the burst pipe, or was that just a choice that they made? Uh, no one specified. Oh, also, uh, shortly after that, they then left the house and moved back to Lexington. No one specified if Ethan ever officially finished the renovation or not. Also, I read, I could not corroborate this, so I'm not 100% about it. But if I hear hot goss, I like to spread it as much as possible. Of course. I have heard that Ethan wiped the data from his phone from the night that Andrea went missing. Interesting. So do with that what you will. In August 2021, a private investigator working Andrea's case got a phone call from a woman who claimed she was there the night that Andrea went missing. The woman said Andrea was taken by a motorcycle gang who raped and killed her in a house just 15 minutes from where she was taken. The woman said it was a trafficking situation and that she managed to escape, but that Andrea did not. I don't know how much I trust this information. Like enough details were given that it could be possible, but it also feels like someone is trying to throw the investigator off the scent and send them in another direction. Yeah. So it was detailed enough that it's like, that could be possible, but it was vague enough that the investigator had no way to corroborate their story. Again, I understand that I am a bitter, jaded, skeptical old lady. I understand that. But, uh, you know, that's who I am. Uh, during a search for Andrea in 2022, a bone was found, which was turned over to a forensic examiner. There are no word yet as to what those results are. Wow. The idea of just finding a bone. I, I don't know how great... I'd be in a search like I I'd, I'd be focused and I'd be looking, but I'd also like if I if I find a body or something or oh, like a bone. God. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, thanks. She talks a big game, but. Deep down. Chicken. Yeah. So. Next case involves Rosalind Velasquez who was born March 31st, 2005, to Sabrina Boozle. She enjoyed playing the violin, drawing anime characters, and she loved her two cats. She moved to Radcliffe, Kentucky from Kansas around 2018. At the time of her disappearance, Rosalind was attending high school, taking advanced classes in preparation for her planned future career in the medical field. But because of the pandemic, Rosalind had been taking her classes at home. But Rosalind preferred it that way as she was being bullied at school. It got so bad that Rosalind had developed a phobia of other people and was diagnosed with depression and social anxiety, both of which she took medication for. To cope with her anxiety, Rosalind would often hide in a walk-in closet or take walks late at night by herself but it was uncharacteristic of Rosalind to leave without letting anyone know first. On August 24th, 2020, Rosalind spent the day with her cousins at the Azalea Park Apartments near North Harden High School. Rosalind was last seen around 2.30 a.m. when her mother saw her in the kitchen filling up her water bottle. Soon after, Rosalind was heard walking away from the apartment. She left her earbuds and her chapstick behind, which is highly unusual for her. She also didn't take any money. Uh, sometime uh, the police, the police listed as early morning. So I, I mean, Lord knows that could be, they seem to think early morning could be anywhere from midnight to like 
5 a.m. So okay. they didn't give an exact time. But sometime in the early morning, Rosalind told a friend on Instagram that she had taken some pills and was walking in the woods. Her cell phone pinged several locations, all within one to two miles or 1.6 to 3.2 kilometers of her cousin's apartment. Despite numerous searches, Rosalind has not been seen or heard from since she was just 15 at the time of her disappearance. Rosalind was described as a Hispanic female, five feet tall, 140 pounds, with curly black hair and brown eyes. Her nose and ears were pierced, and she might have been wearing glasses. She was last seen wearing a blue jacket with a crest on the front right. Also bullying. I can't even... I, I can't even get into another uh, angry, just Christy yelling about bullies, but uh, it's just, uh, I hate bullies so much. And not that, it, not that it matters in the grand scheme of like for bullying, but she was so adorable. Like I just, it's like, and she seems so sweet. It's like, just leave her alone. I know. I not know. everybody gels. Great. You're not into them? Move on. Move on. If you're a bully in high school, you peaked in high school. There yes. I have no time for it. So, while we're talking about a teenager missing from Radcliffe, Kentucky, there is a second one that I would like to mention. Kamaria Lanice Johnson was born November 17th, 2004, to Consuelo, Consuela Job. According to Kamaria's father, on, Mar ugh, sorry, on May 26th, 2021, he and Kamaria got into an argument around one or two in the morning. The father then went to work, leaving Kamaria at home. When the father returned home after work, Kamaria was gone. He drove around looking for her, but when he couldn't find her, he filed a missing persons report. When Kamaria left the house, she didn't take her phone, keys, or any money. But most unusual, she didn't take her glasses, which she required. She needed them to see. It wasn't just a she used them for reading. She needed them to see because, according to her mother, without them, she couldn't really see anything. Kamaria's family posted a reward online asking for any information. A man reached out to say he saw Kamaria walking on the highway and he picked her up and drove her to a gas station just off Highway 60 in Hogwallow in Meade County. It was later said that the man picked Kamaria up miles from home and he drove her a few miles to the gas station, which was about 13 miles or 21 kilometers from her house. Police were able to get footage from a security camera at the gas station, which showed a white car pull up in front of the convenience store. Kamaria exited the front passenger side door and walked into the store. There was no footage of Kamaria leaving the store, but I don't know what other exits the store may have had. Is it possible she went out a back door? I mean, I guess... Um, but if so, then where did she go? It's a fairly wide open. There's not a lot going on out there. Sniffer dogs searched the area but found nothing. There was also footage of Kamaria inside the store. Um, there has never been any report of who was working in the store at the time. Who else was in the store at the time? Did anybody see her? What did she do while she was in there? Like none of that has ever come out, which I find interesting. Kamaria was just 16 at the time of her disappearance. She was described as an African-American female, five foot four, 155 pounds, with long braided black hair and brown eyes. She was wearing a pink jacket, black joggers with red and black stripes on the side, and a pair of vans with flames on them. She also had a Gucci Mickey Mouse mask. The man who drove Kamaria to the gas station has been cleared by police. Lieutenant Brian Davis, who is the lead detective on the case, said he has a five-inch binder with more than 500 pages of evidence collected throughout this investigation. 
but it seems as though Kamaria, quote, just went off the map, went off the radar. And to that I say, may I see your binder? Yeah. I, uh, okay, let's work backwards again. I, yeah. <sighs> there's something confounding about this one because she went to the trouble of putting on a jacket yeah. and taking a mask. And let's yeah. all remember, let's think about this. May 2021, let's think about where we were. We yeah. Vaccines had been coming out, but not everyone had them yet. Um, So we were definitely in a territory where you were carrying masks everywhere. Right. Um, Varying depending on where you are, of course. But I'm just trying to like, I'm trying to like build a, a psychological mindset of, at this of time. Of course. That's what you do. It's what I do. So she went to the trouble of putting on shoes, yep. a jacket, and taking a mask. Now, you could argue the mask might have been in her jacket pocket. Okay, I can get sure. on board with that. But not taking her house keys and not taking her glasses when she required them to see yeah, is really odd to me. And I could even wonder if it's like, she's a teen. Did she somehow get secret contact lenses? Go with me. Of course. You know, is this part of, you know, whatever. I'm not saying that that happened again. I'm I'm only trying to get into the psychological side of this. Not taking your keys doesn't add up to me. What's going on here? Why is she found walking on a highway? What's up? Yeah, Something where was about she this, headed? Where yeah. was she headed? Because my my gut at first was like, was she taken from the home? That was where my gut was going at first. Yeah. Um, but was her mother at home? I couldn't find if she was. I, from my understanding, I think the parents did not live together. Got it. Could be wrong. But I get the feeling that when her father left, she was home alone. Because okay. the father's name is nowhere. Which is why he's always been referred to as the father. Whereas right. her mother has been very very vocal about trying to find her and that sort of thing. And very has her name out there and everything. Interesting. Something doesn't add up here. There's something not right going on here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still listen again, you do this long enough. Um, I think somebody from within that building, I don't think she got herself from that apartment to the, and I don't know the distances. I don't care the distances. I don't think she got herself from the building to a highway with no glasses on foot. I don't buy sure. that. I, I could buy someone else who lives in that building over here's the fight at that time. Hey, need a friend. You want to go get something to drink? You want to go hang out? Sure. Right. I could buy that, of but I, sure. I, I, I could buy her going outside of the building, staying in the area. I could buy that, but I yeah. just don't know that again, a gal or any human who needs glasses to see, I don't buy that you go to the trouble of putting on a jacket. Yeah. If she didn't have the jacket or the mask, it wouldn't bump me so much. Cause then it's like, she left in a rush. She wasn't thinking whatever, but if you, you go to the trouble of putting on shoes and a jacket and you have a mask, but you don't have your glasses or your keys. That says to me, she stepped out of the house like she was going for a cigarette. You know what I mean? Like she stepped out of the right. house to smoke a joint. She sm stepped out of the house um, to get some air. It doesn't have to be drugs or a cigarette or, you know what I mean? But sure. I, I'm just trying to think of, about teenagers. You know what I'm saying? Like, of course. She stepped out of the house for a minute. She put on her coat because she was cold. She wasn't thinking that she was going to need her keys or that she was going to need her glasses because she was just stepping out for a minute. That's sure. what I think of. Again, when I'm trying to think about why would she be out of the house with the items that she had, but without the items that she had. Because it's also May. I know it's the end of May and it's the middle of the night, so there would be a chill in the air, but we're in Kentucky. Yeah. It's not going to be freezing cold. Sure. I, don't I also, I, I want clarification. Were her glasses left at the house? Like they were, were they all, found? Were all pairs of glasses accounted for? Most people with glasses, especially when they require them to see, have backup pairs. I mean, the, the video, she does not have glasses on. 
and the video the there is an image of her which i will post on our socials at true crime and cocktails on instagram um but uh the image of her from inside the store she looks like she's squinting and it's like oh is she squinting to try and read something well then that's that blows my contact lenses out of the water that that makes sense it just feels to me like what again what do teenagers fight with their parents about she wanted to do something he wasn't okay with you know where my mind goes she wanted to go spend the night somewhere else he's going to work anyway what does he care sure i want to go stay at so-and-so's house i buy that yeah right so again it's like I don't know. That's where I would start. If I was the detective on this, who are the friends? Where's the text messages? Get into that phone, get into Facebook, get into Instagram. What, right? you know what I'm saying? Like what else was going on? Did she try to go to someone else's house in a, in a fury, in a rage? She wasn't thinking she left without her glasses and her keys. She got lost because she couldn't see well. She sure. ended up in somebody's car. She ended up in the wrong person's car. It's interesting that this person also came forward and admitted that he picked her up and drove her somewhere. That's also suspect to me because just as much as someone uh, lying, someone lying in plain sight is a trigger to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, and really without him coming forward and admitting it, would they have found the security footage? No. But you also were like, you you pick, you saw this young girl and thought, she looks like she needs help. I'll give her a ride and drop her off at this gas station in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. In the middle of the night. That was so far from home, right? Yeah. Well, then I go, what friends does she have near that gas, gas station? Was she try does she know someone over there? Was she trying to get sure. to another destination? It's was possible. she hitchhiking? You know what I'm saying? Like I I don't know. But again, this is just us if we could get that binder. I know, right? Yeah. Look, we won't tell anyone. Just a few. Give us 20 minutes. Thousand of our closest friends. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You start at the front, I'll start at the back. Yes. It's very sad, though. Very sad. Again, like I, I just, and I'm not judging any of these choices, by the way. I, I hope that that goes without saying. I'm of just course. trying to understand what got her as far away from her, her, where she was staying as it did. And to me, it's yes. just like, that's where you start trying to build the timeline, trying to build suspects. You know what I'm saying? Like, to yeah. me, it's just, you know, that's where I would start anyway. The fact that the yeah. sniffer dogs found nothing, you can see her in the store, but then she disappears. Where did she go from after that store? Like, who was right? working? To your point, who else was in that store? And I will never come, I will keep coming back to, who did she know in that area of town? Yep. Or who did this very innocent angel man driver know who was acquitted, apparently, or was cleared? Who did he know in that area of town? Who was he potentially bringing her to that he was getting money from for showing up with a young gal? Sorry, trust no one. Sorry. And where did he go after he dropped her off? Thank you very much. Could he have just been like, you do what you need to do. I'll pick you up at the back where there's no cameras. So I've seen, I've been seen dropping her off and then circle around, pick her up and take her somewhere else. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't trust, I don't trust anybody. I don't trust if, anybody. If dogs did not pick up her scent outside that building, it's like, well, but then she didn't leave the building, but how's that possible? Well, then we need to get into that building. Then it's, then it's, then it's, right? you know, yeah. Just tell me who was working. Who is working? How have they been questioned? Yeah, a lot of questions. Yes. Lots of questions. Uh, Rosalind Vasquez, so yeah. sad. The fact that this poor girl was dealing with so many um, issues regarding her bullying is heartbreaking. Um, the fact that she had told her friends she had taken some pills and was walking in the woods. She left without her earbuds that was unlike her. It makes me nervous that she had a habit of walking at night alone only because as we know, then it, then you can have somebody much like we've talked about earlier in this, this episode, someone can have eyes on you. Somebody can be, can be paying attention to your um, patterns and whatnots. Um, but this is sad because it just feels like there's no further, there's nothing further. Like it, it's yeah. like, well, okay. She's, she's last seen in the woods. There's, there's nothing left. There's got to be something. Yeah. 
you know? What were the pills? What are we talking here? Who did know who knew about this? What else do the friends know? Was she meeting yes. somebody? Again, these are the places where I try to go back to because look, let's be honest here. Well, structure and spirit here. We were teenage, yeah. we were teenagers once. Yeah. And what do we think about? I'm not denying that she didn't. I, I'm not putting anything on anybody. Again, this comes from I've I've been around the block a million times. I've I've done it all and 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 worse. You know what I'm saying? This sure. is not from judgment. It's just again trying to get answers, trying to think of different ways in, right? Was she going to meet somebody? Was there somebody that that, you know, that's why she didn't take the earbuds because she knew she was gonna go meet up with who knows who? Um, someone from class, someone she met on the internet, someone, you know, like these are all the things. Yeah. What do the friends know? Is there something they know that they're not saying? I mean, again, I hope that we will find out. I hope that this will all come out because it is oh, so upsetting, so sad. Um, Andrea Knable. Yes. This is interesting here. The level of fighting that's happening in this family makes me from the from the yeah. get. I was like, this is there's something not right. And listen, families fight. Don't get me wrong. That doesn't I'm not suggesting that that means anything in the grand scheme of every family. But I'm talking about in terms of a case. Yes. And again, like I'm saying, we're trying to where do we start when you have absolutely nothing to go on? Where do you start? Well, that's of where course. I feel like I start. What's interesting to me. Is that. For five to six weeks, she, Ethan, and Sarah were living in that house. Yes. Where there were often loud arguments. Okay. So they were out at dinner. They fight at dinner. They go back home. Ethan and Sarah won't let her in. She walks to her sister Aaron's house. Then Aaron drives her back. Then Aaron comes and picks her up. Takes her home again. But then she won't let her stay there, which is odd to me. Yeah. I mean, Aaron is the one who said, um, but she, she's the only one, it seems, that has publicly said that Andrea was struggling with substance abuse, multiple personalities. Again, no one else had said that any of this. So it right. feels like it was a, well, I won't let her stay here. It's a tough love thing. Which, and I, uh, and I, I get it, but also she was going through it. Like and it's not the time. I mean, again, there's not there's choose your battles. But anyway, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to shame anybody. But of course, we, we weren't there. Um. However, what here's here's what stands out to me most importantly. Yes. The back, the forth, the back, the forth, the back, the forth. Aaron, you're trying to give her tough love, but you're willing to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with her in your car. What's up? Doesn't add up to me. Yeah. I'm not accusing her of anything, but there's just no. it just doesn't sit right. You know what I'm saying? So she leaves yeah. to walk back again at 154. She arrives at 12, 212, FaceTimed a friend at that time, but no one answered. And this is heartbreaking at this point to me. I know. She can't get into she can't get into this house. Her other siblings are not letting her in, in her house. She's calling a friend. She can't get an answer. And then she and her cell phone were never found. Now, listen, I'm gonna go there. Sure. And this is a speculation because again, when we have nothing to go on, we gotta look somewhere. They painted that bedroom shortly after she went missing. Yeah. Go with me. Of course. Is there a world in which she did end up back in that house? If they painted that bedroom, I assume she did. Is mm -hmm. there a world in which something happened in that bedroom that was being covered up with a fresh coat of paint? It's possible. If that house was known for loud fights and known for potential fist fights. It is more than possible that if there was some arguments, shouting, bump in the night, the neighbors aren't necessarily going to bat an eye because that's been happening in that house for some time. Sure. Right. It's just odd to me that that bedroom was painted shortly after and then they moved away, even though we can't figure out whether or not the work had been done. Right. It's It just feels like there's, you know, when we go back to the basics... If someone has been murdered or someone has gone missing, one of the first questions that's always asked to the loved ones is, is there anyone you know that had any reason to harm this person? Yes. The next one of the next things is, was this person in an argument with any like these are the big questions, right? These are like probably the top two yeah. things. 
Did somebody knowingly want to harm this person or were they actively fighting with someone at this time? And the fact that we know that there was an active fight happening that night with these people and then these people have not cooperated with the police, painted that bedroom and moved away. Yeah. Right. Speculating, but it just that's where I would start again. If we were given the binders and the time. A hundred percent. Don't you think? Oh, there it's it, it's sketchy. To me, it is always going to be sketchy when someone goes missing and specific people close to them choose not to even look. Yes. Like, I understand that it could be as simple as, you know... She brought the attitude of she brought this on herself. I'm not going to be responsible. But do you not even care about your nephews? Like, I know it's just whatever. argue. I would love to know also what they were arguing about. But whatever arguments you were having, there's not a part of you that's like, okay, well, we need all eyes out there. Go search for her so that our nephews can have their mother. Yeah. Or, you know, that you can see your sister or whatever. And it's like, look, I get weird sibling dynamics. I get it. But at the same time, it's like, you just chose not to help in any search at all. That's wild to me. It feels, it just also feels like, well, then you're getting into like, narcissist territory where it's like you think that you're above the law you think that that's not going to make you look guilty because again a sociopath would go i should probably hide in plain sight i should probably make it look like i should probably pretend to be a human you know what i mean (laughs) sure the same i get that all right crystal rogers father of five sorry mother of five excuse me i was reading the word father when i when i was talking that's what happened um This one is so chilling to me. It's so terrifying. The fact that he was, that Brooks, her boyfriend, is in this police interview, gets a call from his brother, who's a cop at the time, and says, basically, don't talk to them. They're going to try and trip you up. What? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, he does Nancy Grace, as though Nancy Grace isn't going to try and trip you up? Like, what? Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird choice to be like, oh, you got to be careful talking to the cops. Talk to the yeah. press. That's the Talk choice. To the press. You know, it's yeah, not great. Um, and then, of course, his brother, Nick, the cop. Later interviewed, originally refused, fails the polygraph. I want to know what he was asked on that polygraph. Yep. What did he fail on? Apparently, it was something about Crystal's disappearance. And see, that's insane to me. Why wasn't he further looked into again because of the fact that brooks results were inconclusive it's like well why wasn't nick made a suspect yes the where, fact that he was where was he that night well he was put on suspension and fired but never made a suspect which is very odd to me yes and brooks was publicly made a suspect but never he as of this moment has never been arrested for it and you know what else is interesting? Yeah, well, wow. And you know what else is interesting to me is nothing was ever released from when they searched that family land. Yes. And that the grandma just refused to be compelled to testify or whatever it was to be deposed. Yeah. Again, I'm like, how are you allowed to just refuse? I don't understand I... that. I didn't think that was, I didn't think it was an option. Yeah, I thought subpoena meant you have You to. had to. I, maybe the laws are different in different places. I don't know. Um, the fact that Brooke's new girlfriend, the fact that he had a new girlfriend that quickly, red flag. Obviously. Well, especially, but you had, a, it's not like you'd been dating Crystal for six months. You, yes. You, ha- you had a two-year-old together. So you were together for probably nearly three years, at least. Yeah. And you were, you were living together. Who knows how long they'd been living together, but you were living in a home with her, raising children with her. And then she goes missing and your thought is, ah, didn't seem weird to me. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah. Um, the fact that the FBI came in again, as you know, my thing is like, if the FBI is there, they know something's up. Yeah. Something's going on. This is not yeah. like the FBI is not getting out to, to Kentucky or anywhere in the United States over a missing persons case. Sure. Again, I'd love if they did. I'd love if there was that kind of resource available, but they're not. The fact that they searched based on this case twice, something is up. Something is up. It just yes. doesn't happen. Right. Yes. Um, again, we have so many other examples of cases you've already listed where that didn't happen. So that to me is a huge, again, that's a huge smoking gun for me. Um, the fact that they searched where this construction buildings were going on and then they found mm -hmm. some things in a driveway but they're not really getting into what it was i don't know the fact again that maybe brooks was shoplifting large items it's hard yeah. to steal siding or or roofing or whatever it was the, like uh shingles yeah. thank you shingles i couldn't think of the word that's hard to steal it's yeah. hard to steal that uh you can't yeah. pocket those no the fact that it was like oh it's fine just never come back to a lowe's again the fact that this custody case, oh. the grandmother was granted no rights, which meant the siblings had no rights to see their sibling. Yeah. Something is up. I don't know what their connection is as a family to like local government. We know that there's a connection to law enforcement. And yep. we know from doing this show long enough, I feel like oh. we're broken records on this episode. Oh. But it's like, then there's, I don't know. That to me says there's something else going on here. Because that to me, I've just never heard of that. I've never heard of a sibling not being allowed to see its other siblings. No. There may be something about the grandparents, but I've never heard of not allowing court, court supervised, um, like a, like a guardian, you know, from the court supervised sure. visitations between the siblings. I've never heard of that ever. I've heard of, of, of issues with, with adults, sure. but I, what court is saying like, no, the grandmother can't see this child. And therefore we're just going to, just going to throw all those kids into that pile. I've never heard of that personally. Yeah. When there's oh, that many siblings involved. That's wild. It, and there's a missing person? Yeah. You're t like the child's already lost someone they're very close to and now yeah. suddenly they lose all of their siblings and their grandmother who they were very close to, their grandfather dies. Like I, well, and that yes. Just, Oh. And that brings me to the last point I wanted to make. When you lay out this string of murders that has happened, the fact that there was already a disappearance in that family yep. um, that ended up being a murder, the fact that there was the string of murders over the course of those years that happened to this, uh, related mm -hmm. around this whole thing, that's yep. why the FBI is involved. Where yep. there's smoke, there's fire, something's yep. up. And oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I feel like that's not the end of that one. I feel like this oh, is a no. recent enough case that there's going to be, I hope, justice found in this one. Because, I mean, listen, it, it's it's always hard to know when it feels like there's corruption happening, whether yes. there ever will be justice. But this just feels like there is so much happening in such a small town. I could see yeah. there being, hopefully, uh, a break in that case. Oh, I mean, that's all we want for any of this, really. But for this one in particular, for me, I just want to read through crystal's phone records yep because i am convinced speculating yep her car was found with a flat tire and the keys in the ignition i'm convinced crystal went out with a friend went somewhere did something on her way back gets a flat tire so she calls brooks hey flat tire can you come get me can you come save me? Whatever. Who knows? Maybe she was even because there was nothing said of whether someone looked like they were going to fix the tire or not. I'm not suggesting she couldn't fix the tire herself. I'm just saying from my perspective, if I get a flat tire, the first thing I'm going to do is call my husband and be like, I have a flat tire. Yeah. You come to my aid. Totally. Um, but I'm convinced she would have called him. He came out. Something occurred where they had a fight, whatever, he got angry. Something happened to her in that moment, and that's why her purse, cell phone, keys, all that in her car 
And then he just later lied and was like, yeah, I, she was on her phone at the time. It's like, really? When, when did her phone, did her phone ping at the house at midnight when he said, did the two of them get into an argument around midnight when she was on her phone and she left in a huff because they were fighting and then on her way back or on her way leaving, got the flat tire. He came out. They kept fighting again. He got angry. Something happened. And his brother showed up to help him move the body. How far was the car from the house, from their house? I don't know where the house was. That's interesting. That Because mm-hmm. you just, you that to me is a huge point to, right? to, to what you're saying. Yeah. It's the fact that the keys were in the ignition. And her stuff right. was in the car. It's she got a flat tire. She called for help. And if they had been fighting, like I know if I'm angry enough that I'm like, I, I just have to go and I have to get out of here for just a minute. I know that if I'm that level angry and then like soon after I have a flat tire, I have to call you and have you come out. They're still going to be angry. Oh, yeah. I have one more possible scenario. Of course. Because it also, I agree with you. It was like, oh, she was playing on her phone. And then when I woke up, she wasn't there. She often went and spent the night at her cousin's house. Now, listen, you're just leaving. You're leaving your five children or however many children may be in the house at that time. At midnight to go spend the night at your cousin's house. That doesn't seem typical. Maybe. But it didn't sit right with me. What about this? What about, well, first of all, we don't even know. Like, talk to the kids. Have the kids been, been, um, have the kids been talked to by a psychologist? I prefer a psychologist with, with the children to the police. But could could, could the, the children be questioned in as, as you know, a, a safe environment as possible about where mom was at what time that night? I mean, now, years later, that would become, you know, more and more difficult. Um, right. But at the time, do you know what I'm saying? Like, w- did she make it home? This is, this is my, yeah. again, trust no one. Why are we trusting his timeline? You know what I'm saying? Like, th- it, these are the things that I always ask. But here's here's a new scenario, speculation, throwing it out there. Yeah. We don't know what kind of cop, what level of cop Nick was, right? Like, was Correct. he a beat cop? Who knows? She's out there. Let's just say she's heard something that she shouldn't have in his world. Sure. He just happens to see her car. Okay? Sure. Pulls her over. They get into an altercation. Oh, fakes the flat tire. Fakes the flat tire. Okay. Yep. The only because it's completely plausible. Yep. Could have been still heat of the moment. Yep. A huge reason why he would be failing a polygraph. Yep. And why Brooks could be inconclusive. Because maybe he wasn't directly involved interesting oh yeah 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 yeah. right oh i mean the failed polygraph the inconclusive polygraph um and the fact that grandma is like nope i'm not going to testify at all screams to me they are absolutely involved because the other thing that could have happened was nick could have called him and said she was at home playing on her phone that's all you need to know don't ask questions. And that's why he could have had also had an inconclusive result if he knew he was lying, but he didn't know the truth. Right? That is very true. I don't know the exact science of polygraphs, but I think if it's like you truly don't know the truth, I think it can come back wonky that it's like, well, if I truly don't know the answer, right? Right. It's possible. Just saying. Just saying. I just also remember very quickly. Yeah. And then we'll get into our second break. And then wrap it up. But I just remember in high school, I dated a guy whose dad was a cop. Yeah. And I got pulled over. I think, was it, did I get pulled over? No, my high school boyfriend got pulled over. No, I got pulled over. And literally it was like his dad knew within seconds because they all can hear everything, right? Everything's going over. And it was literally like within seconds, he was like, my kid with her. Like this became, I remember like the big anecdote that he was telling. Uh Yeah. I just offer it that it's like, who knows? You know what I'm saying? Who knows? Yeah. Well, never underestimate the power of a small town police service. 
We're going to take one more quick break on that chilling note. <laughs> Have one more drink, hit the can one more time, and then we're going to come back with a little bit more on this episode, Missing Kentucky on True Crime Con and Cocktails. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're talking Missing Kentucky. We got a couple more before we're uh, signing off. What you got for us? We're going to start. We're going to start the end. There we go. That's a little better. Not really. I don't know. Sean Ray Glover. I'm just going to stop ad-libbing and focus on my notes so it, I love it. it comes across better. Sean Ray Glover was born May 24th, 1989 to Joanne Carey. On September 27th, 2019, Sean was last seen at the Clay City Inn on Winchester Road in Powell County, Kentucky. He was with his girlfriend at the time. There was some sort of altercation and Sean disappeared. It is believed he didn't run off on his own as he was diabetic and he had left his insulin kit behind. On October 11th, 2019, just Two weeks after his disappearance, the house uh, Sean was living in was destroyed by a fire, which investigators determined to be arson. Sean has not been seen or heard from since. He was 30 at the time of his disappearance. Now, here's where things get confusing. There is conflicting information. Uh, I'm going to present this the best I can, which is difficult when it's conflicting, but according to multiple sources, including Bluegrass Crime Stoppers, Sean was described as a Caucasian male. But according to the Charlie Project and the Kentucky Department of Corrections, Sean was a biracial male. I have no way of verifying this myself because I have never met with or spoken to Sean, um, so I'm just going to present all of the information. Uh, the sites all agree that Sean was about 5'11", 140 pounds, with brown hair and hazel eyes. Uh, Sean also had tattoos on his chest, shoulders, neck, as well as on both arms and hands. Sean's family did some canvassing of the areas where Sean was last seen uh, and where he lived, and they found surveillance video from a house near where Sean was living. His family said that Sean looked terrified in the video, oh, which is God. heartbreaking that they had to see that, but also heartbreaking that they were the ones who had to canvas and find it. Other security footage showed a woman entering the house where Sean was staying, and then moments later, flames were seen coming out of the back of the house. The fire started around 12.45 a.m. and got so hot that it melted the siding of the neighboring house. While Sean was living in the house, it was owned by a man named Donnie Sons Jr., who was picked up earlier that same day on an unrelated warrant. So maybe the fire wasn't about Sean. Maybe it was about Donnie, the homeowner. Um, it's also possible, like... At first, Sean's family thought he might be in the house, but there was no sign that any person was in the house at the time. Uh, Sean also had a history of diabetic seizures. Some have suggested maybe he had a seizure at the Clay City Inn and whoever he was with panicked. Uh, but for amateurs to get rid of a body in a way that it hasn't been found in years seems unlikely or just incredibly lucky. So up to this point, I have mostly done the cases, I have mostly presented the cases, I should say, in a chronological order, with exception to Sean's case, which I moved uh, for the sake of timing to try and, uh, based on the lengths of the cases, there was so much more formatting in this <laughs> than usual. But I tried to go chronologically, um, but I specifically saved this case for last, because this case is why why we're doing this case at all. Okay. Because it, it was when I was researching uh, Lindsay Buziak, who was the realtor in British Columbia, Canada. Right. Um, it was the documentary. I can't remember the title of it, but it was something about like 
murder at a house kind of like it was like murder houses or something like that where Lindsay was uh tragically murdered in a show home and it also featured a story about brooklyn farthing and of course i mean once i started hearing it i had to just finish it out i was intrigued but i knew not enough information so that's how this just kind of came to be i was like i need to find a way to be able to talk about this case with you um on this show and well here we are let's do so, it so brooklyn shay farthing who went by brook was born august 24th 1994 to shelby walker she had two sisters tasha and Paige. brooke enjoyed baking and was a girl scout who made kits for hurricane katrina survivors she was athletic outgoing and loved animals and the outdoors on June 21st, 2013, Brooke and her sister Paige both took their driver's tests. Brooke passed, Paige did not. The girls then went to their fam uh, went with their family to their papa's 70th birthday party. That night, Brooke, Paige, and a cousin attended a party at a friend's house on Red Lick Road in Berea, Kentucky which is about 40 miles or 64 kilometers southeast of Lexington. Paige and the cousin left around 8 p.m., but Brooke stayed behind because she was planning to have a sleepover with one of her friends who was also at the party. Brooke had even brought an overnight bag with her. The friend decided mid-party that she wanted to spend the night at a guy's house instead. So Brooke and the friend got into an argument the friend left, presumably with the guy, uh, leaving Brooke at the party. Another friend said she would give Brooke a ride home. But as the party was ending, Brooke didn't really have a ride. Uh, she was offered a ride home by a 23-year-old named Joshua Hensley, who Brooke had met for the first time at this party. Brooke was seen getting into the vehicle with a male friend that she knew and Joshua. According to Joshua, the friend was dropped off first before Joshua and Brooke headed to Joshua's home on the 100 block of Dillon Court, about eight miles or 13 and a half kilometers from where the party was located. Around 4 a.m., Brooke called her sister Paige to ask for a ride home, but since Paige didn't pass her driver's test that day, she didn't feel comfortable driving out to get Brooke. So Brooke then texted a few friends looking for a ride and even texted her ex-boyfriend. They had allegedly left things on good terms. Brooke asked if the ex would pick her up when he was done working at 7 a.m. She texted him again at 4.26 a.m. saying, please hurry, followed by, I'm scared, hurry. <sighs> Brooke's ex received another text at 5.30 a.m., which read, quote, never mind, I'm okay, I'm going to a party in Rockcastle County. Oh, no. The ex then asked who she was going with, but Brooke didn't respond. The ex, whose name I don't know, later said when he didn't get a response from her, he assumed she was fine, so he just went home after his shift. Joshua admitted that Brooke stayed at his house and said he last saw her in the morning. He said she was sitting on the couch smoking a cigarette when he went out around 4 a.m. to tend to the horses. When he returned at 7 a.m., Brooke was gone and his house was on fire. Investigators found the fire originated on the couch, which burned down to the frame and also burned a hole in the floor. Brooke's overnight bag, purse, and cowboy boots were found in the house, but both Brooke and her cell phone were gone. The area was searched with cadaver dogs, and divers searched nearby bodies of water. Nearly 200 volunteers searched a 1.5 mile or 2.4 kilometer radius of her last known location, but foot searches were called off in July of 2013. Brooke has not been seen or heard from since. She was 18 at the time of her disappearance. Brooke was described as a Caucasian female, 5'1", 105 pounds, with blonde hair and brown eyes. 
She had a birthmark on her left hip and was last seen wearing a gray Future Farmers of America shirt and light blue jean shorts. Joshua said he overheard Brooke telling someone on the phone she was going to a party in Rock Castle County. When Brooke first went missing, her cell phone pinged in Lincoln County, which is 30 miles or 48 kilometers away, not Rock Castle. The phone was then either turned off or the battery died. I don't believe that Brooke just up and walked out of her life. Not only did she not take any money with her, she also left behind her only shoes that she had taken with her. And that night, she'd been texting with friends, making plans to meet up at a car show in Somerset the next afternoon. I also don't believe any of Joshua's story. First off, he let a girl he didn't know stay at his house while he went off for three hours. Also, did anyone see Joshua with these alleged horses? How far away were the horses? Did it normally take him three hours to deal with the horses? And when Joshua called the fire department, when he found his house on fire, he didn't mention that anyone might be in the house. Mm -hmm. And the fire is super suspicious in itself. Are we supposed to believe Brooke lit the couch on fire with her cigarette, either by accident or not? It couldn't have been electricity because the house was in foreclosure and the water and power had been turned off. And if she was supposedly going to another party, who was taking her? Did any of Brooke, Brooke's friends corroborate this Rock Castle story? I doubt it because it feels like Rock Castle was a way to send investigators to the wrong spot because Rock Castle is about 16 miles or 26 kilometers south of Berea, whereas Lincoln, where her phone pinged, is 31 miles or 51 kilometers southwest. And if this isn't all suspicious enough, it turns out Joshua was friends with Brooke's ex. Not close enough that Brooke ever met him while they were dating, but still, any connection to the ex stands out to me. And for Brooke's, Brooke to text that she's scared and then say, never mind, I'm okay. Has an 18-year-old girl ever texted the full word, never mind? It wasn't like NM, it was never mind. And she texted like the full word, like, okay, A, Y. Has any teen ever texted more than just the letters O and K? I don't know. Again, I don't know what Brooke's usual texting style was. But to me, it feels like that last text was sent by someone else who then potentially lit that couch on fire to hide some sort of evidence and use the horses as an excuse or an alibi while he took Brooke to somewhere in Lincoln County. I am, of course, speculating. And just in case you want to know what sort of man Joshua is, in August 2020, he was one of three men arrested for possession of child pornography. He was 30 at the time. He was charged with one count of possession of matter portraying a minor in a sexual performance. On August 19th, 2021, he was sentenced to up to nine years in jail. He was eligible, eligible for parole in January of 2022 but is still currently serving his sentence, which is expected to end in July of 2030. The third man, not that it matters, uh, involved in the child pornography arrest was 61 years old and an associate professor at Berea College. Ugh. I know uh, that this has just been one sad case after another, but to sum them all up in one simple line, I am going to quote Kamaria Johnson's grandmother, DeAndrea McKinney, who said, quote, it's the unknown that's the most painful. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I honestly didn't know how to end this episode. I thought that was actually quite poignant. Thank you. Um, well, listen, I'm going to just jump back to Sean Glover for a second here. Yes. Um, yeah, this is interesting because, again being a diabetic and leaving leaving your insulin that's huge yeah 
that feels to me like you were leaving because you were under duress or you were leaving because you were not awake. Yeah. Or alive. Right. Yeah. Um, the fact that his family had to canvas themselves, they found the surveillance videos, oh. the fact that he was terrified in those surveillance videos. I mean, this is just the fact that the flames from that fire were so hot. It melted the siding on the, on the next house. I know. I mean, that one is confounding. I mean, the, the one thing I thought was like, if the fire is that hot, will you find human remains? And I guess the answer is yes. Like you'll always find some. I don't know. Like because again, assume, cremation, right? But, like if the if a fire uh, gets that hot, it will take all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great of, point of the meat suit. So, uh, but again, I guess I guess the point is, can a house fire get that hot? I don't know the answer to that. But right. how hot does other- it need to be to melt siding? These are the places we would start. The, yeah, these are these are things I should have already written down. No, but but again, it's just that that again feels leaving the insulin kit. That's why I go back to like I don't know that this was an accident. Oh, oh no, yeah. Okay, Brooklyn, Brooke, Ugh. this is heartbreaking. My God, you know, look. If you're a young person listening to this show, we all make mistakes and I don't judge anybody for for those. And, and listen again, like I said before, I've been around the around the clock more times, so many times make your head spin. Sure. But if you're a young person listening to this show, if you take nothing away, always have a buddy. Don't leave always. your buddies. Don't leave your buddy. And I'm not shaming these people. Like I said, people make mistakes and that it is life, but. I'm just saying to to the younger generation, if you're if you're listening, and I know we have younger people who listen to this show, teenagers, yeah. teenagers, don't leave your buddy. Don't no. ever leave your buddy. Even if you think that it's, you know, gonna be fine, they have someone else. Go in with a plan with a buddy and leave with your buddy. Just do yep. that for me. Please listen, listen to your old old auntie. Old Auntie Ash. I could I couldn't be happier that it's such a different tone to be aunt or aunt this was an aunt situation in my opinion um but aunt you know is, what i mean aunt like, feels classier thank you very much very dignified yeah very dignified but yeah i mean again I, I i'm not shaming anyone i'm not blaming anyone but but you know again these are the things that we we think about and i think about all the times in my life where it's like god it's amazing i didn't die um and, oh but that's god, because I, I had some sort of guardian angel and not everybody does in those moments this one though again leaving alone or being left alone at this party ends up getting a ride from someone is trying to get anyone to come and get her. I also, you know, I understand why her sister was like, I can't drive to get you because I don't have my license. And I'm I'm not saying that was the wrong move. She didn't want to break the law. And I respect that. I'm a rules gal too. Um, But God, I bet you that's a guilt that she lives with. Oh, I bet it is. She didn't just drive that car. I bet it is. Or fucking gal. Good God. I know. I know. Um, begging for a ride from your ex who hasn't come forward with a name and then finding out that that ex is connected to this person that you were last seen with. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see all the texts. Has he, was he texting with Josh? Did he know where she, well, he knew where she was because she kept saying, please come and get me. Right. Yep. Were you texting with Josh too? Was he telling you what was going on? I don't trust anybody. Oh, no. Sorry. No. I'm not saying that her ex was in on it, but I'm just saying, like, what else is the story here? What else was going on, guys? Yep. I absolutely don't believe that last text was from her. No No way. No way. Nobody changes their story. Nobody suddenly doesn't get scared anymore. Not in that kind of scenario. I also wish there was a program with the police or another organization where if you're in that situation, you can get a ride, no questions asked. And I know that some communities yeah. do have those. Well, that's and good. I, you know, and I, I, I feel like I would have, I, I wish that had been available to her. I wish there was just yeah. somebody that it's like any time of day you can call no question. And I know some, some families have that too, where it's like, there's no yeah. questions asked. If you need a ride, I will come. Um, 
But that's the other thing. Take from old Auntie Ash. Don't be afraid to call somebody getting in trouble. Take the heat. Make the call. That's not yeah. a victim shame. She didn't do anything wrong. That that fucker did everything wrong. But I'm just saying, learn from this. Um, learn from this because, good God, I mean, what a fucking tragedy. I know. There is just something here. When you hear that he was later charged with child porn, it just puts it all into another perspective. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, it just puts it into another light where you're like, there is a deception, if nothing else, that goes along with that act. There's a million yeah. things that go along with that act, but I'm talking, I'm trying to stick to, to Brooke. So we know now that it's like, I don't believe, I didn't believe anything he said before, but it's, yeah. it's times a thousand now. Um, you went off for three hours, left her alone in the house. And then miraculously the house was on fire when you got back. Okay. I think that fire was just to burn that phone. And I think if you get a fire hot enough, you can melt a phone. Oh, I would think so. Right. You can at least melt it to a point. It may not melt into nothing, but you can melt it to a point that it's not traceable. Right. I would think so. I, I think that's what that was about. More and possible. And, uh, you know. Who knows where she ended up? My God. But that is, but listen, the last thing I will say too, is that if he's involved in child pornography online on the internet, yeah. who effing knows what kind of circles he's running in on the internet. And I'm yeah. not trying to bring up human trafficking again <laughs> in this episode, sure. but honest to God, you know what I'm saying? This is another young, you know, young gal it's it's it, it, he's he we already know that he has a connection potentially to those circles to that world would yep. it shock me to hear that there was something untoward going on that that perhaps she was taken for a time it may not be that she's still alive now i mean of course that's always the hope but would it shock me to hear that she was taken for a time to another location with other people or god knows Fucking what? No, it wouldn't shock me. If he if we was later charged with, with possession of child pornography. And again, I'm speculating. We don't know the details. Yeah. We don't know, et cetera. But I'm just again when trying to build any sort of case when it feels like there's nothing to go on. These are the these are the things we come to when we again are haunted by our own brains full of true crime. Right. Um, but yeah, that one is that's a tough one. That's yeah. a tough one because there's proof of her reaching out for help. And yep. He didn't have anyone help her. Um, um, and a at the time, reasons. she was 18. Josh was 23. 23-year-old, I know it doesn't... Five-year age difference is nothing in the grand scheme of things. When your age ends in teen... No, stop it. Take her home. It's a, it's a no. If she was 20, 20, 23... Okay, fine. 18? No. If it ends in teen, hands off. Oh, like, yeah. stop it. And, and again, yes. Like, no, and again, she didn't no power, go there. No water. Come hang back at my place. Well, we don't even know that that's what nope. she agreed to. He could have told her that he was going to take her home and then he just drove her there. Yeah. For all we know. And that's why those texts were coming from her. Like, it's like, I got to get out of here. I don't know how to get out of here. I'm scared. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Well, listen, Christy Oxborough, what yeah. a fabulous first episode of, of, of the Missing series. Such a great overview. So many cases. My God. Um, hopefully, again, you know, keeping these names alive, keeping these cases alive is so important. And again, to the young people, um, it's just let this be educational, if nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Listen to aunties. Listen to the aunties. Listen to the aunties. And again, I can't stress enough. The, both can be true. We are not in any way suggesting that any, the only people that did anything wrong in any of these scenarios are the people who did abductions, murders, stalkings. Those are the only people that did anything wrong. None of these victims nope. did anything wrong. No, nope. But that doesn't mean that we can't use these things to educate ourselves to try and move forward to hopefully um, avoid uh, any further tragedies for other people is all I'm saying. Yes. Um, fantastic work. I'm very proud of you. I'm, I always am. But, but again, the ones you curate, they always, they, they touch me in a different place. So kudos. Well oh. done. Well, thank you. 
That cult is very kind. Cult like a see it. And thank you, dear listeners, for listening to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. And if you'd like a little bit more, if you'd like to listen to the Bert and Larry podcast, go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails. It is a subscription-based service where we offer four bonus episodes a month at our top tier of subscribing levels. Uh, we do a monthly live Q and a, you can vote in a poll. Um, it's, it's a whole lot of fun. We have a, we have a laugh over there. It's a romp like the glee curse. If you haven't checked out that episode of our show, do so it's award-winning. Um, last thing of course is truecrewmerch.com, The only place for official true creme and cocktails merch. Check that out as well. There's Bert and Larry merch over there too, if you're interested. Uh, Christy, do you want to tell the people about the next episode of the show? I do. I'm going to give a, very similar to what I said earlier. The name is going to sound like I'm saying it wrong. When you see it written, you're going to be okay. like, oh, lady, you butchered that name because I looked at it and went, oh, I know how to say that. But then my gut went double check. Yep. And I checked multiple times, multiple newscasts that even interviewed his family and said the name to the family. So I, I, I like, it doesn't feel like I'm saying it right, but this is how it's pronounced. So, on the next True Crime and Cocktails, Renny Joes. That's right. That is, of course, our June patrons poll pick uh, from the poll that we offer there on Patreon. So we are going to be covering that next week. And then we'll get to the July patrons poll pick shortly after that. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, bird brothers. Oh, good night, Donna. <laughs> <laughs>